Mr. Sean Willens, interview. Take one, Mark. Slavery was at the heart of Southern culture, um, the heart of American culture in many ways too, but certainly Southern culture. I mean, the, uh, the American South was the richest, wealthiest slave society on earth in the 1850s and 1860s. Indeed, maybe even in history, um, one, 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 some, have, some have said. So, uh, you know, that you cannot think about the Old South without thinking about slavery. You know, the slave South had 3.8 million slaves, uh, right, enslaved people. That's from the start, you know, um, tells you something about how important slavery was to the South. And, you know, the American economy relied to a certain extent on, on cotton and the cotton exports. And uh, cotton was the major export coming from the United States abroad. And that cotton was being produced by enslaved labor. So um, it, it's impossible to think of the United States without thinking about slavery. I've got to say, the, the quality of, of education when I was in school, you, know, you could go through an entire course of American history and know something about slavery, but not really understand the institution and how important it was and how the institution came to be, how the institution changed, all of that. That's much more central than it, what it was. Um, there's been a revolution in American historical studies over the last 50 years, really, in the centrality of slavery. Um, which had been denied for a very long time. You know, the Civil War, some said, wasn't, wasn't fought about slavery, it was fought about states' rights and so forth. And you still hear that out there, um, which tells you something about the um, lack of, uh, you know, the, 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 the shortcomings of, of secondary education. But I think, I think we've actually gotten much closer to being right than we, than we had before. Um, as I say, slavery, underwent about the same time, not coincidentally, the same time the civil rights movement really got going in the 1950s, um, historians began to put slavery back at the center of American history where it belongs. And at this point, I don't think that you can get a decent, um, certainly a college education in the um, uh, history of the United States in that period without having slavery right there. I know that because I, I teach that, that period right here in Princeton. And um, the name of my course is Slavery and Democracy in the, in the New Republic. Um, so it's about those two things, slavery and democracy, how they could uh, coexist, how they became contradictory, um, it's a very, it's, it, that's at the heart of what American history was in that period. And then the, 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 the consequences of emancipation, the consequences of the war, are still very much with us. I mean, that's not a historical question, that's a, that's a political question. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, slavery, well, and slavery and race, I mean, the two are connected, obviously. I mean, they're not, they're not exactly the same thing, but, you know, insofar as slavery placed African Americans in a particular place in the social hierarchy, in the social order, et cetera, et cetera, certain kind of oppression. Um, the, 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 the identification of slavery with race, with um, Africans, people of African descent, I mean, that is still very central to American history, to American life. And the slave narratives were crucial to the anti-slavery movement, first of all. Um, and to changing northern opinion about slavery. I understand that, you know, when, once the slave narrative started to appear, um, Frederick Douglass's most famously, but not just Frederick Douglass's, um, you know, people in the north didn't have much of a comprehension of what slavery was. You know, there was a lot of mythology about the happy slaves and how great it all was for everybody, and it was a benevolent institution and all of that. And the slave narratives really punctured through that. The slave narratives really forced Northerners to come to terms with slavery in a way that they hadn't before. Not that all of them would, but many of them did. And it was not just the narratives, but having, you know, the 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 the, the, few, uh, the, the former slaves who had escaped. The, what's, the, what's the term for them now? Fugitive slaves used to be called. You know, the slaves who had escaped from slavery, who had freed themselves. Um, it wasn't just they wrote; they actually went out and lectured. You know, they actually went around and gave important lectures. Frederick Douglass most famously of them, you know, and, and you know, Frederick Douglass would say, people want to know where, where I was schooled, and he would say, my diploma is on my back. It's a very powerful statement, and then, you know, people knew what he was talking about, that he had been educated in the ways of cruelty that were, that was the essence of slavery. So the narratives are very important. Now, 
you know, the narratives are filtered. It's not just, you know, uh, unfiltered testimony because it's filtered through the people who are helping to compile them and write them. And so it was written for a political purpose. They were propaganda in effect. I mean, they're not quite literature. They're not quite propaganda. They're somewhere in between the two, but they were very, very important. Um, I would say second only to something like Uncle Tom's Cabin, which um, had a great deal of effect. But Uncle Tom's Cabin grew in part out of the slave narratives. Um, so so the, two, the two go together. At the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, um, there were anti-slavery delegates there. There were pro-slavery delegates there as well particularly from South Carolina and Georgia, and they wanted to make sure that slavery was given as much protection as possible under this new constitution. You know, they'd seen that the northern states had begun emancipation as early as 1780 in Pennsylvania, and they were worried about what was going on in the north, and they thought maybe now that we're forming this powerful new nation, maybe these guys are gonna do something about slavery that we won't like. So they came to the, to the convention really, you know, loaded for all of that. Uh, the anti-slavery people, were loaded too, as it were. Well, I don't want to put it that way. The anti-slavery people were prepared as well. And so there were these conflicts over, over slavery in various, on various issues, um, which led to the compromises, the famous compromises in, um, in Philadelphia over the Three-Fifths Clause. Uh, there wasn't so much a compromise, but it, it, certainly it, it, it gave uh, the southern states, the slaveholding states, extra power in the, in, the, in, the, in the House of Representatives and then in the Electoral College. Um, the 20-year delay of abolishing the transatlantic slave trade, that was very important. Although, you know, the fact that they managed to get anything in the Constitution that the federal government could abolish slavery, that was something the Southerners did not want to see happen. So they weren't happy about what happened with all of that. They went back and they had to explain it to everybody back home, and it was not that easy to explain. And then the Fugitive Slave Clause as well. Um, or the, it's actually the Fugitive Servant Clause because it refers to servants rather than to slaves. But there were these compromises that were there. And without those compromises, it's unlikely that South Carolina or Georgia would have gone into the Union and then it would have been no nation at all as far as the people who were there at the convention were concerned. At the same time, though, there was a question as to what the position of slavery was going to be in national law. It's important to remember the Constitution is, is it's a federal document. You know, it's forming a nation out of states. There's going to be national law, the things that the nation can do, the national government can do, and they're going to be the things that the states can do. And a great deal is let, left to the states, um, including property laws and all things like that. And it was pretty clear from the beginning that the status of slavery in the states where it already existed was not going to be threatened by the national government. The question then, though, was what do we do about national law? What do we do about those areas where the federal government has purview, like over the national territories, for example, or in the new federal city they were going to, they didn't know what it was going to be called, but they, you know, they, they identified it. The high seas, there are a bunch of places where the federal government would have purview. Would slavery be tolerated there? Or would slavery be automatically tolerated there? And the, uh, the, the delegates to the convention made it very clear that they were not going to let that happen. I mean, that they were not going to allow um, slavery to be part of national law, to be inscribed in national law. It leads to one of the things that really confused people about the Constitution. You know, the Constitution, certainly there's, slavery is certainly there, but the word, the, the first time that the word slavery appears in the Constitution is in the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. The word does not appear. And historians, we have arguments about why that was. Um, but the record, I think, shows pretty clearly that it wasn't that they were embarrassed about slavery. You know, they weren't trying to hide it. If they tried to hide it, they were doing a pretty bad job <laughs> because people could figure it out pretty quickly. But they wanted to make sure that the, that, that the idea of one person owning another, what they called the property in man at that point, that that would not be part of national law. Uh, the delegates from South Carolina and Georgia, they were a wily bunch. They, um, they did their best to get it in there all kinds of places you can read the, 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 the records that are left of the Federal Convention. And you can see them, you know, sneaky doing this. Every time they try it, they get, they get shot down. Um, the, the Convention majority will not allow that. Now, we can, uh, historians argue all the time about why that was. How much did the, did the framers really expect that slavery was on the way out? Um, 
Certainly the delegates from South Carolina and Georgia did not think that slavery was on the way out. They thought that that was the center of their life and they were gonna keep it going. But there were many who did. There are many who thought that you know, the slave economy, which was then based on tobacco, not on cotton, this is before the Cotton Revolution, that you know, slavery was going to eventually fade away, that the force of the American Revolution was so great, and the economy, the economics of the tobacco trade, which at that point, you know, I like to say to my students, there were only so many pipes in Europe, right? That only so much tobacco was going to be purchased. There was a glut in the trade. So there was a feeling that you know, this is not going to last that much longer among some of the delegates. Um, so we can argue, we do argue about how much the framers actually thought, that generation actually thought slavery was on the way out. Some did, some didn't. But regardless of that, the majority of the convention wanted to make sure that slavery was not going to be made an intrinsic part of the new nation. You know, that the new nation was not going to be a slaveholder's republic in a way that, for example, the Constitution of the Confederacy, the, con the, the Constitution that the seceding um, South actually created in, 1860, in 1861, oh yeah. All the parts in, in, in the federal constitution where they kept slavery out, they put it in. They actually say, yeah, now we've got the constitution that we ought to have really had in, in 1787. But that was at the end of a long you know, fight about slavery which was gonna lead to the Civil War. So that was a very different kind of constitutional you know, proposition. By 1850, certainly, um, slavery is intrinsic to American political life. The slaveholders had more or less dominated American political life for a very long time. Um, the most important thing to understand is the Cotton Revolution, first of all. I mean, you know, after 1787, in 1793, the invention of the cotton gin makes it possible to grow cotton at a scale and in places that it simply wasn't going to be possible before that, um, feeding into making cotton the most valuable agricultural commodity in the world because of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution's leading sector was uh, the manufacture of cotton um, in, in uh, Britain, but also in New England. And so cotton was really, you know, today, it, it was a bit, a bit like, you know, the, the petroleum, um, um, what, what, what petroleum became in the 20th century, cotton was in the 19th century, the most valuable agricultural, you know, extractable commodity, right, or agricultural commodity. So that's number one, is to understand that cotton, that slavery is going to have a rebirth. Um, the institution of slavery undergoes a rebirth, which is, which is crucial in understanding the politics of all of that. From the beginning, as I say, the South Carolinians and the Georgians, I always say it's nothing personal, but it's always South Carolina. It's always South Carolina that's at the forefront of, of pro-slavery militants. And they had been from the very beginning, um, which has to do with the, with the politics of South Carolina. But at any rate, um, you know, from the very beginning, they are fighting very hard. But, but the, the expansion of a, um, a cotton kingdom is going to mean that you're going to have in politics as well as in the culture as well as in the economy, you're going to have a force that's very, very pro-slavery, increasingly pro-slavery, that hadn't been there from the beginning. Um, new slave states come in, you know, um, um, Alabama, Mississippi. Um, later on, you know, there's going to be a fight over Missouri. But this is going to change the, the, po the political dynamics fundamentally. Um, there are uh, the ways that the parties get aligned very early on. Um, you know, the, the Jeffersonian Republicans, they were, um, they were not all of the slaveholders by any means, but they were a slaveholding interest that was connected somewhat paradoxically to the more liberal interests of the North. Um, you know, to the, the small artisans and so forth. The, the, there was this very, very, to us now looking back, a kind of um, contradictory alliance that was, that was part of American politics. And that was going to have a lot to do as well with keeping slavery there, making slavery even more central to American politics than the framers might have imagined that it would be. There is this interesting moment, this very interesting moment um, in 1819, 1820, because there had been an anti-slavery movement in the North, and it, it gets going, and it's there, and it's not as big as it's going to be, but it's pretty ferocious in certain, certain places. In 1819, Missouri applies to become a new state, and the question is, is, the state, is Missouri going to be allowed to come in with slavery or without slavery? Slavery already existed in Missouri at that point, so everybody assumed, nah, it's, it's going to be a slave state. Well, a New Yorker named James Talmadge gets up and says, no, we're going to um, amend the statehood bill and slavery will not be allowed to survive in Missouri. We're going to get rid of slavery in Missouri. It causes this huge crisis. And for the better part of uh, two years, actually, 
Um, there's, there's, there's talk that there's going to be a civil war. Now, there are some people who say that if there was a civil war in 1819, it would have amounted to a fist fight on the floor of the House of Representatives. Uh, but that's a little misleading, too, because there really was a very strong anti-slavery, free Missouri movement, it was called, that got going in 1819, 1820. Really scared people. John Quincy Adams, who at that point was the uh, Secretary of State, um, writes in his diary, he's a very famous diary, he writes in his diary, he sees a terrible portent because the South can understand, the Southern, the Southern slaveholders can understand, that there's a new party ready formed, as he put it, that is out to get rid of their institution, to get rid of slavery. In the aftermath of that crisis, the political center decides that they're going to clamp down on the whole question. They, no, they don't want to see the Missouri Compromise, the Missouri Crisis. They don't want to see the Missouri Crisis happen again. So they are determined to keep the issue of slavery out of national politics. And an entire political system grows up dedicated to the proposition that slavery, either you know, anti-slavery or pro-slavery, it's not going to become subject to debate the way that it had been at that moment in 1819, 1820. So going into the 1830s and really into the 1840s, you have a political system, political parties, that are dedicated to keeping slavery out of debate. That's functionally about as pro-slavery as you can imagine, right? We're not going to talk about it. It exists. It's going to keep going. So you have this, this political system which it looked like it might be able to open up for a minute, and then there was a shutdown. And that's where, you know, the history of anti-slavery gets really interesting, too, because that's where, you know, um, uh, well, you get the likes of David Walker up in, up in Boston, you know, um, a, a free black from, South Carol from, uh, from North Carolina. Look, David Walker, a free black from North Carolina who had migrated up to Boston, um, writes a fiery pamphlet calling for, um, you know, an appeal to the colored person, people of the world, calling upon um, them to, to renounce slavery, to rise up, you know, and if white people did not want to give slaves their freedom, well, then they were going to take it anyway. That was pretty scary. But that was outside of politics, you see. David Walker was in part a reaction to the fact that politics had closed down. And then David Walker is followed by, you know, the likes of William Lloyd Garrison and the rise of the immediate establishments in the 1830s, much more radical than the, um, the, the, the previous anti-slavery movements had been. Um, that's in part a matter of just disgust, but it's also a matter of the fact that there was no place for them to go, you know, that, that politics was not going to work. The idea of moral suasion, of that was the only way that you were possibly going to get it over with. It. The, the, the political system was so corrupt that getting involved in it was going to get you nowhere. So, you know, by the 1830s, um, you know, there's a feeling, in fact, that the political system is deeply pro-slavery. Um, and then Abraham Lincoln's going to come out of all that. In the 1830s, um, two things conjoined, right? Um, one was um, black abolitionists in um, the cities in particular, um, New York, Philadelphia, Boston. The outcome of northern emancipation had in part been the growth of black communities um, in the bigger cities, right? They wanted to get away from where they'd been to come to the big cities. And um, there is a, a really very impressive uh, collection of institutions, you know, churches above all. You know, the AME church gets born in the 1790s, but it really grows in the cities thereafter. Um, the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge, I mean, you name them. There, there are lots of different groups out there. The first black newspaper is founded in 1827, a Freedom's Journal um, in New York City by John Ross Worm and, and um, Samuel Cornish. Um, there is a black abolitionist constituency that had not been there at the end of the 18th century that has grown. That's crucial to understanding the direction that, that, that anti-slavery politics is going to take. You then have also um, a religious revival among blacks and whites um, that it, we refer to it as the Second Great Awakening, um, which evangelicized American Protestantism in no small to no small degree. Now, that wasn't necessarily going to lead people automatically to be anti-slavery, but it led a lot of people in that direction because it emphasized questions of personal righteousness, of one's personal relationship to God. It changed the whole connection between man, women, and God in ways that, that re required um, people to take account of their own you know, more, uh, relationship to slavery, among other institutions. 
And between the two of those things, I think, the Second Great Awakening and the growth of, of, of black abolitionism, there is, a, there is the, the beginnings of a truly radical abolitionist movement. Um, we date it, you know, I, I always date it from David Walker, but that's okay. Um, m most people date it from 1831, when uh, William Lloyd Garrison gets his newspaper, The Liberator, going, followed soon thereafter, a couple years later, by the founding of the American Anti-Slavery Society, which is the first great mass anti-slavery um, organization in the United States. There had been others out there. Um, they're mostly local. This was, a, this was a bigger deal. This was going to transform the whole character of anti-slavery politics. Um, it's going to make it much more um, broad-based. It's a mass movement. And they adopt all, all kinds of very, what should we say, um, imaginative uh, ways to try to um, um, force the issue. They weren't going to be able to run people for office. They didn't think that was a good idea, but they were going to force the issue through direct action. And how were they going to do that? Well, they did it through petitions in large measure. They got hundreds and thousands of people to sign petitions calling for the end of the, the, the domestic slave trade, calling for, above all, the abolition of slavery in the nation's capital, um, which was a very powerful idea at that point because, as you see, as I said earlier, the federal government had control over D.C., had, had control over the government of the District of Columbia. So, so it was believed that Congress really could abolish slavery there. You know, it couldn't do it anywhere else. Um, it couldn't do it in any of the existing states, but it could do it there. So these petitions really roiled the Congress. And the Southerners were getting, very, Southern slaveholders were very upset about all of this. And, uh, and there's a small group of Northerners, led by actually ex-President John Quincy Adams, who are standing up for these petitions and saying, you have to listen to these, you have to listen to these. And the Southerners say, we're not going to even, we're, we're not even going to um, honor them with the idea of, of listening to them. We're not even, we're going to table them right away. We're not even going to, we're going to stop. So they adopt something called the gag rule which prevents these anti-slavery petitions from coming to the fore. It's a ba it backfires, of course, on the Southerners because the more that this happens, um, the more people begin to think, well, wait a minute, you guys are not allowing American democracy to, to, to happen. You're not, not allowing people to, uh, to um, um, you know, voice their will. Um, there's one famous story out of all of this. When John Quincy Adams gets up with a petition, and it's, a, it's sort of a, well, he gets up for a uh, house of representatives and says, I here have a petition signed by X number of slaves. Of slaves. Well, the Southerners, you can imagine, they go absolutely nuts. I mean, it's one thing to have anti-slavery people petitioning the Congress, but to have enslaved people petitioning the Congress? So they go crazy, and they try to stop it, and they stop it, and they, you know, point of order, point of order, blah, blah, blah. And then... Um, they want to stop John Quincy Adams, and then Quincy Adams reads the petition to say, yes, we slaves are very happy to be in slavery. <laughs> now, this was, <laughs> the Southerners are going, oh, God. You know, it was all a way to just embarrass them, which he was very effective at doing, he and his group um, inside, inside of Congress. So you can see here, you see, the, the politicians did not want to allow slavery to be involved in national debates, but the abolitionists force it. The abolitionists force it to happen. They, they, they're not going to run people for office, but they're forcing it. They're making it possible. And every time this happens, it's all over every newspaper. It, it, it's, 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 you know, publicizing the cause. The other thing they do is they, they get um, anti-slavery pamphlets, and they send them down to the South. They put them in the mails down to the South. In those days, you know, now we get our mail sent to us apart from email and all of that, but real snail mail. We got our mail delivered. Those of us who are old enough to remember stamps and stuff. In those days, you could address a bunch of, uh, 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 send a whole bunch of stuff to the local postmaster, and the local postmaster was duty-bound to actually keep those pamphlets in the post office where anybody could pick them up. So the, um, the American Anti-Slavery Society starts blanketing the South, with the, and the postmaster is supposed to keep those things there. Well... They don't know this stuff. Who's going to pick it up? You know, a free a free person of color could come by, pick it up, read it. Say, hmm. Most likely, that that person knows someone who's enslaved. Maybe that gets out to them too. This is dangerous as far as the Southerners are concerned. For the American Anti-Slavery Society, it's a way to raise hell. You know, it's a way to, to, to it's direct action, as we call it in the twentieth century, twenty-first century. They were the masters of all of that. So that was the politics that they practiced in the 1830s. And um, it did a lot 
to raise the consciousness of, of, of northern whites about the status of slavery. It was going to remain a minority movement. It was going to remain outside of politics. But, you know, even then, it was, it was larger. It was, you know, 100, 150,000 people, people signing those petitions. That was, that was a sea change from what it had been, even in the 1820s when there was that movement that was going. Um, it, it, ran, it ran into difficulties. It, 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 it did not free a single slave, if you will. I mean, it didn't change a law. It didn't get that done. It raised consciousness. Um, but then when, by the time we get to the end of the 1830s, there's kind of a feeling of exhaustion, actually. I mean, they've been at it for 10 years. You know, moral suasion, the South wasn't going to get rid of slavery. All the moral suasion in the world was not going to get rid of slavery. What, would, what, what was going to happen? Where, where was change going to come? Um, black abolitionists were particularly, you know, they started holding, you know, they'd been holding national conventions, but they're beginning to think, you know, maybe we have to go in a different direction. And a number of the white abolitionists in the American Age Slavery Society begin to think the same thing. So the, the, the movement hits a crossroads in 18, right at 1840, actually, at the end of that decade. The movement hits a crossroads about what direction it's going to take. In 1840, the American Anti-Slavery Society, the great abolition society, splits. It splits in part over the question of whether women should be involved in the, um, in, in the leadership of the movement. A lot of people, Garrison included, wanted to turn the anti-slavery movement into a much broader reform movement to take on a whole bunch of causes, including the cause of women's rights. Um, whereas there were others who said, look, we have our hands full just dealing with slavery. Um, we have to stick to that. And, and the movement splits. The movement also splits on the question of politics. Um, you know, Garrison and others truly believed that the American Constitution and the American political system was intrinsically pro-slavery. Garrison is later going to burn the Constitution of the United States in Massachusetts on the, in the Commons there, or not in Boston, but it's, I forget, Framingham, somewhere up there. He burns the Constitution in 1854 saying that, you know, it's a covenant with death and an agreement made in hell, that America itself is intrinsically pro-slavery. Not all the abolitionists agreed with him about that. They were abolitionists to look back on the Constitution, what we talked about earlier, the, 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 the Constitutional Convention, who saw anti-slavery potential in the Constitution that, that Garrison and, and, and his uh, supporters did not. And this actually ends up being the majority of the abolitionist movement, um, actually drift over to this point of view. And one thing that they do is to start a political party. They say, look, What's the center of this, this, this democratic, quote unquote, democratic political system we have? You know, um, since the 1820s, you know, white male um, um, suffrage had, were, had already spread, but you had the growth of political parties, you had an involvement of ordinary white men, unproperty as well as property, um, that hadn't existed before. It was a big deal that it hadn't been, you know, quite before. If we're going to get anywhere in terms of slavery, we better be involved in politics. We can't stay outside of politics. And there's room for us in politics. We can defend our views. We can attack slavery and still defend the Constitution of the United States because there's, a, there, there's an opening here for us. Well, they started that opening in 1840. They form a political party. Um, they nominate James G. Burney, a former slaveholder from Kentucky and ended up in Ohio. Um, they don't actually call it the Liberty Party yet, but they're, they're going to. A man named Garrett Smith in New York who's a great radical abolitionist, he's going to give it the name. But at any rate, they run, and they get 7,000 votes. Now, that's pretty small. Um, it, there's not a mass um, outpouring of support for the Liberty Party in 1840, which, you know, if you were only interested in getting votes, would have been very discouraging. Uh, but the Liberty Party was after something more than that. They knew that this was the beginning, not the end. And they began attracting all sorts of new people into their, into their, um, you know, into their ranks. Um, a man named Salmon Chase from Ohio was a friend of Bernie's. He, he switches from the Whig Party over to the, to the Liberty Party. Um, that's going to be the germ of the anti-slavery politics that eventually is going to bring in Abraham Lincoln and, and lead to the Republican Party in, in, the, in the late 1850s. But it begins in 1840 with the, with the, the formation of the Liberty Party. Um, 
Much is going to happen in the 1840s, which is going to change the character of, of anti-slavery politics. It has to do, again, with westward expansion. It has to do with Americans, America's imperial ambitions. Um, but it's going to bring the issue of slavery back in in a way that the, um, you know, that the mainstream had hoped to keep it out. This time, however, you do have an abolitionist movement that's a mass movement. This time you do have a liberty party. This time you have people, even in the Democratic and Whig parties, are beginning to feel uncomfortable with the fact that slavery is no longer, you know, is, is being kept out. They can't keep it out any longer. So by the time you get back to these questions in the 1840s, you know, it's, it's going to be very different political calculus. In the 1840s, there's a lot of pressure, as I said, because of America's imperial ambitions, et cetera, the, um, um, the annexation of Texas, and then the, the Mexican War, and the, the grabbing of you know, half of Mexico. Um, well, that's not true. Am I right about that? It, it doubles the size of the United States, at any rate. It uh, means there's a lot more land. And all those issues about territories and slavery and what's going to become of these territories, they're opened up again. Right? Now, of the two parties, the, um, the Whig Party is more f better disposed to anti-slavery than the Democratic Party was. The Democratic Party really was, I mean, many of the largest slaveholders were in fact Whigs, but the Democrats ended up becoming the party that was, being, was taken over really by the slaveholders, the pro-slavery uh, interest in the South. Um, the Whig Party had a southern wing that was very powerful, many slaveholders there. But it could not sustain itself under the pressure of the politics of the 1840s. So by the time you get to 1854, a crucial date in understanding all of these politics, with the, uh, the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Whig Party dissolves. The Whig Party falls apart. Um, the, you know, Southern Whigs are all for the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Northern Whigs are all against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This party cannot exist any longer which is going to leave a lot of people without a political home, including a, a, a Whig ex-congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln, who doesn't have a home anymore. He doesn't know where he is um, in politics. And at the same time, he understands that, look, slavery is now inevitably at the center of our politics. There's no keeping it out anymore. And um, we, can't, we can't think about politics without thinking about the question of, of, of Kansas and Nebraska and thinking about the question of slavery. So, 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 so politics changed profoundly. Before 1854, Abraham Lincoln was a stalwart Whig. He said he was an, uh, a Henry Clay Whig. He was a great admirer of the Kentucky Senator Henry Clay. He believed in the program of the Whig Party, which at that point was in favor of things like internal improvements, building canals, railroads, using federal support to do all of that, a high tariff. He saw the Whigs, as opposed to the Democrats, as being the party of progress, the party of uplift, the party of improvement. And he was a very dedicated Whig, um, and, and stayed that way right up to, he, as he himself said, until there was nothing. <laughs> he was in the Whig Party until there was no Whig Party left for him to be in anymore. Um, so he believed in the, in the Whig cause. Now, um, understanding that this all goes back to the Missouri Compromise again, um, the idea was that the, the Missouri Compromise had supposedly settled the question of slavery and expansion. They let Missouri in, but it meant as a slave state, they let Missouri in as a slave state, but it meant that everything above the 54, 40, 30, no, no, everything above 30 degrees, 30 minutes, it was going, no, no, everything above 36 degrees, 30 minutes, was going to be uh, free soil. And the Kansas-Nebraska uh, law, Kansas-Nebraska Act, undid that. It undid that. When you undid that, then the whole thing's going to fall down, fall apart politically. You know, it, it means now that all bets are off. It means now that the slave power, as they called it, is on the offensive. It means now that the last protections we had about possibly stopping slavery's expansion, that has been undone, this agreement that was made in 1820. So that people like Lincoln, who are anti-slavery, I mean, his anti-slavery politics were pretty clear at that point, but it was a, it was a recessive, it was, a, you know, it was not at, at the front of his politics, it was the, more at the middle or the back of his politics. Now it is at the very front. I mean, with Kansas and Nebraska, there is no way that politics is going to be able to go back to the way it was um, under the Whigs and Democrats. So um, it wasn't just the Whig party fell apart, but the entire political system was, was transformed.
And slavery, then, is the major issue, as it will remain you know, right through to the end of slavery in 1865. Enduring issue, well, we ended slavery, but the, the effects of slavery certainly are, you know, sure. I mean, um, it's not the only enduring issue, but it's one of them. Um, and, you know, um, look, at the heart of American history, I believe, is, you know, the same contradiction that arose in 1787. It's the contradiction between a democratic republic and the institution of slavery. And, um, you know, uh, the, the, the founding generation thought that you could, you know, establish one with the other at the same time. And um, it, it, it took a horrific civil war uh, uh, to undo that idea. Um, but the institution was strong enough. And then the aftermath of the civil war wasn't just the civil, slavery itself, but the fact that the politics of Reconstruction ended up the way that they did meant that the promise of the war was shut down. And, you know, a, 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 a southern white ruling class came back um, to try and impose as close as they could to impose the institution of slavery back. Um, um, and they were allowed to do so for a very long time um, until the revolutions of the 1950s and 1960s. So insofar as we're talking about slavery, yes, I mean, it's about slavery, but it's also about the politics as it formed out of that. You know, there's always a struggle. There was always a struggle. The struggle was there from the start. And I, it's important, I think, to get, I try to get my students to see this. There was never a point where slavery was everything. There was hardly ever a point when anti-slavery was everything. But there was always a struggle. And the struggle is, you know, that is American history in many ways. It's not the only struggle, but it's the central one, I think. Um, um, and, and, and so we have to see American history in those terms. And um, that's certainly the way I do. Um, but um, um, to have abolished slavery, which was an extraordinary thing when you think about it. I mean, until the revolutionary era, there was no anti-slavery among white people. There was none. I mean, the Quakers, some, at the end of the 17th century, but slavery had been an institution that went back millennia. It goes back to classical times. Um, slavery in the New World was there from the beginning in the 15th century. I mean, it was there. And then African slavery comes in very quickly. This was accepted. No one said anything. I mean, the enslaved said, <laughs> had plenty to say about it. But, 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 their, but their revolts were, were crushed. You know, they could not prevent the expansion of this vast plantation complex throughout the New World, slave-based plantation complex. So when you step back then, when you take the long view, um, the abolition of slavery is an extraordinary thing. It's not just an American story, it's in the story that you know, in Britain and in France and other places, the, all, all of the European monarchies that established slavery in the New World, right, all had to deal with it in one way or another. But when you think that for all the millennia that slavery had existed, and then to think within the space of 70, 80 years, in the case of the British, less than that, the institution is abolished in the West. Not in, well, not in the way. You know, it's abolished in the United States. It's still going to continue in Cuba and, and, and Brazil. But nevertheless, it's on the defensive. I mean, this is an extraordinary turnabout to me historically. And it, it astonishes me, actually, to think of how the combination of slaves, the enslaved people, um, free blacks, um, um, white abolitionists, white politicians, how that converged to end this institution that had been so powerful for so long and so unquestioned for so long, so rationalized for so long, as the work of God, let alone the work of man, that slavery was biblical. I mean, this is an amazing story, actually, when you stop back and look at it. Um, maybe the greatest story in modern history, I think, um, the abolition of slavery. Um, but, you know, we're, how, how many years are we away from the Civil War? 150 years away from the Civil War? That's kind of the, that's a, in the, in the great expanse of time, that's kind of a twinkling of the eye, too. You know, we're not so far away from slavery that we can say that slavery's legacy is not very much with us. Now, we can be frustrated at that, um, and we should be. Um, but the struggle has always been there, and the struggle continues, and the struggle will go on. Um, and um, again, when I, when I think about where, um, where the United States was, say, in 1880, 
when I think of where, where slavery was in 1903 when Dr. Du Bois you know, published The Souls of Black Folk. Imagine when America was in 1903. To see us a century later where we are, that, in a, again, I take the long view, that's a fairly brief period of time. Of course, I'm getting older now, so that it all seems to be a, a briefer period of time. But nevertheless, um, there's, for all of the, the, the torture and the heartbreak and the sorrow and the, 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 for all the grotesquerie of history in that period, um, you know, the arc of the moral universe has been going more or less in the right direction, it seems to me. But it has only done it through struggle. And, and believe me, there have been setbacks. Um, you know, revolutions do not sometimes, you know, revolutions can go backwards. And, um, you know, we've seen that happen plenty of times most poignantly at the end of the Civil War. Joshua Giddings from Ohio was a fascinating character in all of this story. Um, he was a congressman from Ohio. He was an evangelical Christian, very religious man, going back to the Second Great Awakening, um, and was deeply anti-slavery. Um, in, in, in the early 1840s, he, um, he gets in trouble with his own party, with the Whig Party. He's there in Ohio, and he's, in, he's there in the, sorry, he's there in the house, and there had been a, a, a revolt of, on, on, on a ship called the Creole, and there was a, led by a cook named Madison Washington. Can you imagine an enslaved man named Madison Washington? Now, that's, that's a, only in America, right? Um, he, he, he comes, a, comes up in the house with a proposal defending, basically, the Creole rebellion. Well, you can imagine what the response to that was. Um, not just from Southerners, but from his own Ohio Whig party. They basically cast him out. He is thrown out of the House of Representatives. And he goes back to Ashtabula. I think that's where he's from, Ashtabula. And he gets reelected. You know, his, his people are anti, as anti-slavery as he is, and they send him right back. So, so Giddings is kind of a hero among the anti-slavery Whigs in the early 1840s, precisely off the Creole incident. He's doing a lot more than that, but that's simple emblematic. In 1846, another Whig from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, gets elected, uh, get, no, in 1846, Abraham Lincoln gets elected to the Congress from Illinois. And he goes to Illinois, he goes to Washington, he's trying to figure out where he's going to live, because in those days, congressmen lived in boarding houses. They didn't live in fancy digs, they, they, they lived in boarding houses. He actually had Mary Todd Lincoln with him at that point. I think, I think she just decided to just get out of there. She didn't want to hang around Washington too much longer. But he gravitates to a, um, um, a boarding house owned by a woman named Anna Spriggs. And it's right behind, it's right near where the Supreme Court is now, right behind the Capitol, right? They can walk to work. Huh? Well, Anna Spriggs' boarding house was also known as Abolition House. It's where Joshua Giddings was located, among others. And while everybody in there was not a Joshua Giddings, and some actually, there were some Southerners in there as well, or some border state people at any rate in there as well. But it had a reputation of being, um, you know, a pretty solid anti-slavery place. Theodore Dwight Well, the great abolitionist, had hung out at an abolition house. It was pretty notorious. That's where Abraham Lincoln decides he's going to mess. That's where he's going to board. Um, that's going to be, these are going to be his messmates. So from very early on, um, uh, and, and, and Lincoln befriends Giddings, and he gets it. He's not, he's not Joshua Giddings at this point. He's not a big abolitionist. He's not going to be. He's from central Illinois. He, <laughs> he's not going to you know, kill off his, his own. His people would not have reelected him um, as, they, as, as Giddings' people reelected him in 1843, 1844. Um, but he's sympathetic. He's sympathetic. And while he's in Congress, actually, you know, the, the, the gravitating to Abolition House was one, was one um, sign of all of this. I mean, he certainly opposes the Mexican War. He stands up and says, takes the, the anti-slavery Whig position, Northern Whig position on the war, which is that this is a, an unjust war that had been started by the President of the United States, James K. Polk. He demanded to know the exact spot where American uh, soldiers had been fired upon that was supposedly the cause of the war. He got the, nick the nickname Spotty Lincoln on that account, which, you know, not the nicest nickname to have, but it was done in the cause of uh, opposing the Mexican War alongside another congressman, the man I was mentioning earlier, um, John, Qu John Quincy Adams, um, who would also oppose the war ferociously. 
Um, Lincoln supports a provision called the, the Wilmot Proviso in 1846-47-48, which um, um, was going to keep, make sure that any lands obtained in the Mexican War were going to be free of slavery. It was a kind of um, Northwest Ordinance, you know, going back to the 1780s, a Northwest Ordinance for these new lands. Strong anti-slavery, really a, a flashpoint in anti-slavery politics. Again, showing that you could not keep slavery out anymore. It was there on the floor of the House. Um, Lincoln says he must have voted for the Wilmot Proviso, I don't know, a dozen times or something. That was an exaggeration and only got voted on five or six times. But nevertheless, he voted for it. Then he proposes something which I think historians have not given him quite the credit he's due, which is that he proposes a gradual emancipation um, plan for Washington, D.C. Now, it doesn't get very far. Um, it doesn't pass. However, this had been the great abolition, one of the great abolitionist causes in the 1830s. This was a radical idea only 10 years earlier. This was something that the, you know, the Congress was passing gag rules to keep out, keep petitions about this out of, 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 the, of the debate. Actually, it goes back even further than that. There was, as early as 1805, there was a guy, a wonderful guy, who was anti-slavery guy who was proposing to get rid of slavery in, in the District of Columbia. Well, Lincoln picks up on that. That's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting you know, convergence, because here is this you know, Illinois Whig who is you know, anti-slavery, but not that anti-slavery, but he's going to be putting forward this, what had been an emblematic abolitionist uh, demand. He's putting it forward in the House um, 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 when he does. Um, these are all signs that, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson said of, of Walt Whitman that his, his great career, which began with Leaves of Grass, must have had a long foreground someplace. This is Abraham Lincoln's long foreground in, in terms of anti-slavery politics. You can take it all the way back to the 1830s, actually, in Illinois. But, um, you know, it's not the forefront of his politics, but it's there in his politics. So that you can see, you can understand why in 1854, coming after the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, but in 1854 with Kansas and Nebraska, there's no question what side Abraham Lincoln's going to be on. Well, by 1860, the Republican Party has emerged as a, um, you know, a, a power. It was the second party. It was unclear. After the Whigs fell apart, it was unclear who was going to succeed the Whig Party. And for a while, it looked as if it might be the nativists. There was a nativist movement that had gotten going in the 1850s. Actually, it was earlier, but it really gets going in the 1850s. And they established something that was known as the Know Nothing Party. And they, they nominate, in 1856, they nominate former President Millard Fillmore for the presidency. Um, so there were a lot of people who thought, well, the Whigs are gone, now the Native Americanists are going to, you know, the, the, Nat the Nativists are going to take over. They were called the Native Americans, not to be confused with the Native Americans that we referred to, but that's what they called themselves. Um, but then there were the anti-slavery people as well, the so-called anti-Nebraska, you know, um, faction that was many Whigs, some Democrats, and the old Liberty Party and Free Soil Party. So there was a contention as to what was going to su uh, supplant the Whig Party. In the end, it was the Republicans. Um, the the Know-Nothings are not going to be able to become an, a, a sectional force, let alone a national force. The, um, the Republicans, however, do become the successor um, to the Whig Party, and they are a sectional force. Um, Abraham Lincoln does not appear on the ballot in large parts of the South. Um, you know, he, he's just not there. The Republican Party does not exist. But it was an extraordinary coalition. You know, I mean, Lincoln himself, as late as 1855, is still wondering where he's going to go. There's no Whig party left. Where is he going to go? He's not quite sure. He ends up going in with the Republicans. Now, in 1858, um, Lincoln had made quite a name for himself and made quite a name for the Republican Party in his, run, in his race against Stephen Douglas, for the uh, senator from, U.S. Senator from Illinois. Lincoln and Douglas had been, you know, each other's nemesis for a very long time. Uh, they knew of each other very, very well by this point. Um, they were both very ambitious men. Um, Stephen A. Douglas was the absolute incarnation of the pro-slavery or the pro-Southern Democrats. He was a racist of the highest order. When you read his speeches now, and every time you see the word Negro, that's not the word he said in that speech. Um, he was unabashed in his racism. and. Um, and he believed that, he, he, he did not believe that slavery was a terrible moral, a terribly important moral issue. 
So he ran for the Senate on the platform the idea of popular sovereignty. That is to say that the people who were out in the territories ought to be able to decide for themselves whether slavery would be there or not. Lincoln took the other view, which was precisely that the United States government, the Congress in particular, had the power to keep slavery out of the territories and ought to do so, and had a duty to do so. So in 1858, and, that, that, and that's the position of the Republican Party in 1856, but, and, and, and they ran very well in 1856, but Lincoln helps to bring those politics to the forefront with those great debates against Douglas in 1858. He loses the election, in part because the um, legislature was basically, you know, the, 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 there was a gerrymandering, basically. The old, the old uh, legislative districts kicked in. He, he got the most votes, but he didn't win the election. Sound familiar? Um, but he made a great impression. Um, there's, here was this Westerner, this Western Republican, who was um, you know, standing up to a very, the, maybe the leading Democrat outside of the president, Stephen A. Douglas, and giving him a run for his money. And, um, and, and making the Republican argument as eloquently and as powerfully as, as anybody had to this point. So the Republican Party has come a very long way in a very short time. Um, it had sort of been born in, in 1854 in the aftermath of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, by 1856, it does run a presidential candidate, John C. Fremont. Um, but by 1860, it is contending for national power um, in, in, in no uncertain terms. Um, it is thought that you know, whoever the Republican nominee would be in 1860 um, would stand a very, very good chance of winning the election. Um, uh, a guy named John Brown kind of messes that up for the Republicans um, at the last minute because, you know, it looks like, yeah, maybe the Republicans aren't going to be so popular. Um, but they managed to do so. And, um, but it was very much Lincoln's doing, I think, again. Lincoln, had, had, had Lincoln not gotten the nomination in 1860, I'm not altogether sure that the Republicans would have won that election. William Seward, um, who, the, the leading contender besides Lincoln for the nomination, the per person that everybody thought was going to get the nomination was William H. Seward from New York, who had had a long-standing anti-slavery um, um, career, a very distinguished one. And he had given a very powerful speech, actually, um, saying that there was a higher law than the Constitution. Um, he was sort of misconstrued in all of that. But he was thought of as a real radical on the anti-slavery question, um, much more radical than Lincoln was thought to be. And um, I, 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 this is just a guess. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a historian. I'm not a prognosticator. But my guess is that if Seward had won the nomination, he might have had a very difficult time carrying what we think of as the lower north. That is to say, Pennsylvania, even parts of New York, um, Illinois, Indiana. I'm not so sure that they, that they would have gone for, um, for Seward. And it took Lincoln to keep them into, in the Republican Party. And, you know, if Stephen A. Douglas had somehow won those votes and had somehow managed to, to eke out a victory, well, then all of American history would have looked very, very different. Um, um, so I think that Lincoln's nomination was, was, really, very, was really very, very important. Um, I'm not saying, look, I don't want to go on record saying that it would have happened. It, I, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a who knows. But, it, but let's put it this way. That Lincoln's, Lincoln's winning the nomination, and there's still going to be, you know, it was going to be hard for the Republicans to win that lower north. Nevertheless, it was much more possible for them to do so with Lincoln as the nominee than, than Seward as the nominee. I'd put it that way. So that while there was no guarantee either way, um, Lincoln's, Lincoln's um, nomination was really important. Abraham Lincoln, oh, look, he's six foot four. He, um, he looks um, you know, kind of gawky. Um, you know, uh, there are those who say he comes right out of P.T. Barnum. You know, he's, uh, you know, he's kind of freaky looking, and he himself says this all the time. You know, um, um, people, have, uh, people have, have accused him of being two-faced, he said. He says, if you had a face like mine, you know, he would make fun of his own looks. Um, Lincoln, when he spoke, either in the debates or um, even when he was giving a speech, um, people describe him as he would begin the speech looking kind of awkward and not necessarily all that comfortable and didn't look great in his clothes necessarily and he didn't speak. He had a very high-pitched voice. Um, it's not, it was not a stentorian voice like this. It was not a politician's voice. It was kind of high-pitched and squeaky like this. Um, 
But he did have an ability, which was he could throw his voice very far. He was able to reach the back of a crowd. Remember, there's no microphones. This is 1858. You know, you, what, you, what you've got is what you've got. And he had an ability to project his voice to the very back of a crowd um, about as well as anybody. He learned this as a lawyer in part. He had that ability um, so that even his sque in his squeakiness, he could still be heard and understood. But people describe him as starting off kind of disheveled, and then suddenly he would warm to his subject and a kind of glow would come upon him. And he would be able to, you know, pull people in. This, 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 this ugly rube from Illinois suddenly became charismatic, people said. You were drawn to him by the way that he spoke, by the calmness, by the clarity of his logic. Um, you know, this was the late Lincoln. Early Lincoln was something of a slasher. He, was, he, could, he could really take, take you apart if he wanted to. Um, and there's some of that in the Lincoln-Douglas debates. But Le Douglas, on the other hand, is like a bulldog. I mean, Douglas is short. He's called the little giant. Um, he, he barks as much as he speaks. Um, he, he uses racist terms all the time. He's vindictive. He's nasty in a way that Lincoln is not. Lincoln can be witty and cutting, but he's not going to, you know, um, um, be attacking Stephen A. Douglas in the way that Douglas is attacking him. Very different style. Very different style. Which, you know, uh, Douglas' supporters loved it. You know, they thought of him as a, you know, a real man. He's a tough guy. Um, um, but Lincoln, Lincoln had a way of dominating the debates, especially once you got out of the deep south part of the state, out of, out of what was called Egypt, down, you know, in the southern part of the state, which is mostly settled by, by you know, refugees from the south. Once you got up, you know, further north, um, he had the ability to, um, um, to take, to turn Douglas's logic inside out. Douglas had a problem in 1858. And it was a small, it, it, it seems very abstruse now, but it was basically that he supported the Dred Scott decision, even though the Dred Scott decision basically had nullified popular sovereignty. His view was popular sovereignty. He couldn't, you could not own them both, but he tried. He tried to square the circle. And Lincoln was absolutely devastating because he had this clear, logical, Euclidean mind, to, but, he, but, but he had the ability to, to express that Euclidean mind in ways that really you know, undercut or, or cut Douglas to the quick. Not to say that Douglas was ever undone by all of this. He had his tricks. Um, but Lincoln certainly stood up, stood up to him. Um, and don't forget, Stephen A. Douglas had been in the Senate for a long time. Lincoln was this ex-congressman, one-termer. I mean, he was a nobody, quote, unquote. And the fact that he was able to take on, you know, the, one of the great men of the Democratic Party, perhaps the greatest man of the Northern Democratic Party, um, and, and, and fight him to that kind of standstill, well, it not only made his name, but it made Republican politics more, more powerful, more popular than it ever had been before. Lincoln was a, um, was not glib. You know what I'm saying? He was not a guy who would, he wouldn't necessarily have been really great on TV necessarily, for example. Um, he, he was a very thoughtful person. He, he prepared for his speeches. He prepared, he, he studied, he, you know, he did a dissertation amount of work behind some of his speeches. The, the, Cooper, the Cooper Institute speech in 1860, which is one of his most important. Um, you know, he really worked on that for a very long time beforehand. So when you say his speeches, his speeches reflect that kind of careful thoughtfulness that he brought to, to, his, to everything, but he certainly brought it to his politics. Um, and he certainly brought it to, um, um, well, he brought it to his presidency, but he brought it to his politics. So, so yeah, I think that the, 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 again, the logic, the clarity, but also the information that he, that he, that he had it, it to hand. Um, this was Lincoln, the, 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 the lawyer, in terms of preparation, um, but also in some ways, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call him a scholar exactly, but he was, you know, extremely well prepared. And, and, and you see that in the speeches as well. Um, it's the combination of, of, yeah, careful preparation and lucidity, you know. I mean, when you read a Lincoln speech, you're not left mystified as to what the man just said. You know exactly what he just said. Um, and and that was, that's an art. That's not that easy. Um, now, 
you know, you read the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which is a different kind of thing, and, you know, he'll have his prepared remarks, but then it'll, it'll be the, about the cut and thrust of politics, and he's very good at that, too. Um, you know, Lincoln is a... Um, Lincoln's a politician, <laughs> and, and, and you have to understand him as a politician at every moment along the way, and that means being able to react as well as, as being able to attack. Um, and, you know, he could do that very well. But what I think makes him stand, what, what I think, where I think Lincoln really stands apart is, you know, the care with which he went about his, his thinking. He would not come to a quick decision about something. You know, he was, he was a, he was a, uh, you know, he, he thought long and hard. Um, he, he wasn't, I don't want to make it sound like he's a doofus. I mean, he's not, he's not, he's not, you know, he's not slow in the way, he's just, he's, there's a deliberate, there's a deliberation He's got a deliberate mind as well as an, ele as well as a, an elegant mind. He's got, a, he's got a, yes, a deliberate mind as well as an elegant mind. Herndon, William Herndon, his law partner, once said that Abraham Lincoln was a little engine of ambition that knew no rest. Um, yes, that's true. But he was, in terms of his public statements, he was always, uh, he was always political. And this leads a lot of people to misunderstand what Lincoln is talking about. Um, I think John Hay actually said at some point that unless you understand the context of what Lincoln is, is saying, unless you understand what is going on around what he is saying, you can never really understand Abraham Lincoln. So if you take him out of context, as lots of historians are wont to do, um, you will misunderstand what he's talking about. Ab Abraham Lincoln has outwitted just about as many American historians as he has, you know, politicians of his own day, um, because precisely because uh, people don't necessarily understand him as a as a, as, a, as a politician, as a political leader. Um, so, so yeah, um, um, I mean, you know, for example, the, the famous example, the most famous example, is the the 1862 response to Horace Greeley, you know, where Greeley is very, they're very impatient with Lincoln for not having come up with an Emancipation Proclamation or not doing enough to, 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 to turn the war into a war against slavery. It's still a war for the Union and it's not turned yet into a war against slavery. So he, um, so Greeley publishes this editorial in the, uh, in the Tribune, in the, in the Daily Tribune, um, the Prayer of the 20 Million, I think it's called, and, um, you know, attacking Lincoln, criticizing Lincoln for not having moved faster. And Lincoln responds with a response, with a very careful response, um, which makes him sound very conservative. You know, he says, look, you know, if I, if I could save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. If I could slave, save the Union, if I could save the Union by freeing none of the slaves, I would do it. If I could save the Union by freeing all of the slaves, I could do it, but I'm here to save the Union. So everybody thinks, wow, you know, really a conservative, well, what people didn't know was that he was already drafting the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, that he was in a political situation where he knew he was going to have to prepare more conservative northerners for the fact that he was about to deliver this thing, that the political context he was in, he wasn't being conservative, he was being political. Now, you can say there are those of us who, who think that being political is a terribly immoral thing. Well, that may be true unless you're a politician <laughs> and unless you're a president. And if you're a president, you have no choice but to do that if you want to get done, if you want to get anything done. So um, this, is, this, is, this is one example of all of that. There are many examples of all of, uh, like that um, where, where what Lincoln says has a meaning that's not exactly what people man imagine it was at the time, and not exactly what, what uh, historians have imagined that it was since. Um, and, you know, again, historians write about politics a lot, but they don't necessarily understand politics. You know, and, and um, it took me a long time to figure this out myself, but being a little bit more around politics. Um, you know, politics is, is, is sometimes called the art of the possible. Well, I guess that's true. Um, but there's an art to that, um, to that art <laughs> that I think a lot of historians don't understand. Um, it's much more, it's much more artistic, it's much more creative, it's much more powerful, and it's an art that many of us just don't get. Um, um, so, so, Link and Lincoln exemplifies that. Another, you know, FDR was the same. 
um, in many ways. I, I think of the two of them as, as of American presidents. Well, and Jefferson could be that way too, actually, um, often speaking by indirection, um, saying what you thought you wanted, he, he telling you what you thought he heard, it turns out to be nothing really about what he was saying, or, or, or was strategic rather than um, um, didactic. Lincoln comes out of a part of Kentucky where the, the Baptist church was actually very strong, and it was an anti-slavery Baptist church. People forget there was probably more anti-slavery, organized anti-slavery in the border states in the, at the time that Lincoln was a young man, 1810, 1820, than there, were, than there was in the North. Um, and the Methodists, the Baptists in particular, had a very strong anti-slavery animus. That was all going to go. That was all going to disappear by the time he got to the 1840s and 50s. But early on in the 19th century, it was pretty strong. Indeed, many of the, the migrants who start off in the border states like Kentucky, who end up in Illinois, Indiana, Illinois, um, were, you know, relative, I don't want to say poor, but they were, you know, um, um, not rich. Um, you know, um, middle class, that's not the right word. Um, they were farmers who wanted to get away from slavery as much as anything else. Now. Um, they just thought that it was a, you know, a, a disgusting institution and they didn't want to be uh, living amidst it. They also didn't like the fact that there were slaveholders who were running the show. They just wanted to get away from all of that. And Lincoln's family was like that. Um, um, so they end up in, in, in Indiana and then in Illinois. Um, does it take, I mean, Abraham Lincoln's not a Baptist. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln is sort of something of a free thinker, actually. And um, this is part of his growth, his, 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 um, his evolution. Um, you know, as a young man, he's reading Thomas Paine and people like that. And he, he, he never becomes a conventional Christian, actually, um, despite the fact that many have tried to make him into such a thing. Despite the fact that he mobilizes religious speech, and particularly King James Bible, as effectively as anybody in American history has. Despite all that, he never, and he went to church and so forth, but he was never a particularly believing uh, Christian. So he didn't buy the Baptist part of all of that. But I think that he came, when he says, when he said that he was naturally anti-slavery, I think that that's part of it, that it goes all the way back to his youth in Kentucky in, amidst the anti-slavery Baptists. Um, and, um, you know, there are many stories of Lincoln, um, you know, seeing coffles of slaves uh, and his trips down the Mississippi as a river boatman and so forth. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're true, um, but I don't think there was a moment where the scales suddenly fell from Abraham Lincoln's eyes, you know, where he was one thing and then all of a sudden he discovered that slavery was a terrible thing. And that's what I think he meant by all of that. And I don't think he ever had an idea that slavery was an institution or a human relation or a form of oppression that he could, you know, um, abide, let alone um, something that he could support. Um, um, so that's what I think happened. He didn't go through a, you know, a pro-slavery or, or indifference to slavery and then suddenly become anti-slavery. I think it was there from the beginning. I mean, Abraham Lincoln is born in dirt. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln comes up from, you know, about as, you know, it's not, well, let me back up. I didn't mean that. Because it wasn't dirt. But Abraham Lincoln came from, shall we say, a, a, a hard scrabble background. It was, he was no, by no means affluent. He was not to the manner born, right? He was a, if there was a self-made man, and in an age of self-made men, Abraham Lincoln was one of them. So it took tremendous ambition for him to, to get, even to the, to the point where he was a successful lawyer in Springfield, Illinois. Um, you know, so, so this was, it, I want to say it's all-consuming, but, you know, I think that he knew that he was, Cut up, cut above others, that he could make it in the world um, by dint of his um, brains. Um, he could also make it as, uh, on, on the basis of his brawn too. And he was no mean, you know, fighter. He could he could toss people pretty far. Um, that was one of the reasons that he turned, you know, he turned that to good political use. Actually, his uh, his ability to fight, literally to, to wrestle. Um, this showed, you know, in a time where where. You know, white guys are, are the soul of American democracy, and tough white guys are maybe even more. Well, he's a tough white guy. He can do that. Um, he can play that game. Um, but he's also this other, this other figure. And so his ambition is, is, is extraordinary. Um, his wife, you know, um, Mary Todd Lincoln 
said at some point, I believe, that you know she was going to marry the president, uh, the next president of the United States, or man who would become president of the United States. Stephen Douglas actually courted her, so she made the right choice. She knew an ambitious, you know, suitor when she saw one, and Abraham Lincoln was certainly you know ambitious. But the question of courage and ambition, um, I'm not sure that um, in, in American politics um, one can be um, one can be effectively courageous without ambition. You know, I, I don't think that you can you can unleash that. I mean, I can be car I can be courageous, um, but unless I want to go somewhere, I'm being courageous that nobody really does. It, it's, it's to no effect. Um, you know, um, so you have to combine that. Um, you, you're surely not not going to get to the to the high office, the highest offices in in, in the land. Um, without ambition, um, um, it's 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 almost a you know it's it's a it's a given I think. Um, now, ambition can um, sometimes occlude principle. Can sometimes you know wipe principle out. If you're only ambitious, you know, um, usually you end up as 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 a you know um, a person successful in your own time. Um, who leaves very little, a uh, very little of a mark on history? Um, you know, there, there's a million of them. Um, the thing about Lincoln was he was, and I, I've written this, but I mean, he was an egalitarian politician. Now that seems, in many people's eyes, that's a, an oxymoron. That's a contradiction, right? How can you be an egalitarian and be a politician at the same time? Well, you can, and Lincoln was that, which is to say that he understood he had very deep principles which only deepened as he, as he, as he grew older. Um, but he understood that they were going to get nowhere unless you were a politician as well, unless you were going to actually be able to wield power. And you're only going to get to wield power if you were political. And he's the embodiment, actually, of, of that kind of egalitarian, you know, that kind of egalitarian political combination. Um, um, there are others. Um, I mean, I, just recently, I mean, uh, my good friend, um, um, John Lewis, was like this. I mean, he, he had that combination of understanding how politics worked. He really, really did. It came through tragedy. It came hard. It was not necessarily something he was born to in, in Alabama. Um, but he, un he came to understand it. Of, 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 the, of the people I've known in my lifetime, he came as close to that combination that I see in Lincoln historically as anybody I've ever seen, of someone who could... Um, be, be just as egalitarian in the practice of his politics, um, but just as political in his pursuit of equality. Um, that's something that, 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 that John Lewis had and, uh, and Abe Lincoln, very different men, uh, very different people in many ways, um, but, uh, but they had that in common. You know, Lincoln came out Come, you know, comes out of Kentucky and he you know, comes into Indiana and Southern Illinois. You know, the, the world there is, is racist speeches everywhere. You know, I mean, racist speeches everywhere I was growing up too. I mean, I, I, you know, this is America we're talking about, but but it's it's just sort of around, and 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 so he's going to pick up on that, particularly when he's giving speeches to get elected. He's going to be flattering the crowd, and um, he knows out there that if you use certain words, they won't be objected to. No, they make they make you familiar to, to the crowd. Um, my favorite example, and that's not my favorite example, but the, um, the worst example of this actually was a speech that he gave in 1852 um, in, 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 in support of, of Winfield Scott, which is not exactly, you know, you think of, but it's the 1852 presidential election, you know, and he makes a kind of um, w weird um, race, racialist, it was not racist, but it is racist, remark about Franklin Pierce of all people you know, accusing Franklin Pierce of being a mulatto, in effect, uh, in his politics. Now, you know, that, that's not the nastiest turn, but it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's pretty nasty, pretty ugly. Um, I think that after 1854, that really drops away in, in, in Lincoln's, in Lincoln's um, speech. It does drop away. Um, because I think that, that um, poli it, again, it's a, it's a measure of how slavery has taken over um, American politics, so that, um, <clears throat> you know, and now I don't want to exaggerate his racism beforehand. I mean, it's there. It's not the forefront of his politics by any means. He's not a racist politician in the way that Stephen Douglas was. 
you know, and in fact, if you want to, you know, get the measure of, 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 of Lincoln's anti-racism, match him up against Stephen Douglas and you'll see it right away. So, you know, as you said, Jackie, I mean, casual, it's casual. It's that kind of, you know, what white guys said in those days, if you're from Illinois, and, but, but never at the forefront of what he was talking about. You know, he was, even in the 1830s, for example, in the, in the Illinois State Legislature, when the legislature wants to, you know, censure the, the abolitionists, for example, um, and, and do so in ways that are pretty racist. Um, he does not go along with that. He does not, he doesn't, doesn't see that. Um, so when it comes to the core of the principle of, of the matter, that's not part of his lexicon. Um, but, you know, he is of the time and the place that he's from. Um, and um, it would be interesting to go back and look at, you know, everyday political speech. Every, I'm sure scholars have, and I just haven't read it. You know, what, what, what everyday speech was like, you know, among white men in, the, in, in, in those parts of the country, or in any part of the country for that matter. Um, you know, um, its casualness, in fact, might, might, might be the, the, the measure of its relative unimportance in trying to understand the man. Um, you know, in, in Springfield, for example, <clears throat> People don't realize this. There were a lot of, of, of black families in, in Springfield, Illinois in the 1840s and in, in, into the 1850s. Um, in fact, right by his, his neighbor, he does not live in the, you know, the fancy, fancy part of town. He lives in a, he's got a nice house. He's got a good lawyer's house. But there are black people coming in and out of that neighborhood, you know, in that neighborhood. He has neighbors. He's got black neighbors. And there's no sense of him being at all, A, uncomfortable, being, you know, in any way upset by this, this, is no, this struck him as normal. So, so I think that um, in understanding um, Lincoln's relationship to black people, those references I think are not you know, particularly indicative of him. Um, you know, and then later on, of course, when he does befriend Frederick Douglass, um, when Sojourner Truth does come to the White House, you know, um, they're, they're struck by the fact that, you know, you know, people talk about fragility, that white people can't talk to black people, it's a difficult thing. They're struck, in fact, by how, how open and honest and, you know, un, unbothered he was by the fact of race. You know, and this is in 1860, you know, 62, 63, 64, when, you know, it's a very different American than we have today. So, um, I'm not making him out to be some sort of paragon of, 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 of virtue of any kind. But um, I do think that, that Lincoln's... Um, see where Lincoln was from, and you get a sense of where he ended up. And I think that that's, that's important. That's not to say that he, 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 you know, he evolved. Um, he, he didn't have to go through these sudden changes that I think some historians think that he went through. I don't think there were two Lincolns. I think there was one Lincoln. The Lincoln that you saw at the end was the Lincoln that you began with. But it's a, it's, it's a, it's a person who's evolved. Part of the Compromise of 1850, um, Congress passes a Fugitive Slave Act, which is uh, the most draconian of its kind. I mean, it had been an earlier one in 1793, and it basically turns the entire North into a slave patrol. You know, it says that you will be fined, you will be, you know, you will be punished if you do not help to, to run down fugitive slaves. Now, um, this was, you know, went far beyond what the Constitution <laughs> called for. Um, um, but it was constitutional, you see. I mean, it was not something that was, you know, clearly unconstitutional. It was just bad policy in, in, in Lincoln's terms. Now, the, ex the, the reaction to the Fugitive Slave Act in the North is ferocious. Um, there are any number of incidents in the North where fugitive slaves who are supposed to be brought back are um, rescued or are protected by um, northern anti-slavery Northerners. Um, in some cases, you know, scooted up to Canada, gotten away, you know, taken away. There was a very famous incident in 1854 where a, 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 an escaped slave named Anthony Burns was tracked down in, in, in Boston and um, was supposed to be returned to the South. And there was a, you know, huge hue and cry in Boston, of all places, which was kind of the center of radical abolitionism. And um, the, the president of the United States, Franklin Pierce, actually had to call up federal troops to accompany this one man, to make sure that this one man was taken down, taken back to the South into slavery. And those troops did indeed march Anthony Burns to the docks, but the streets were filled with people protesting. 
filled with people protesting. Um, so the Fugitive Slave Act, you know, it, it gave birth to Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, the most important anti-slavery piece of you know, writing probably um, in the entire period. Um, what was Lincoln's reaction? Lincoln's reaction was, this is a terrible thing. I don't like the Fugitive Slave Act, but it's constitutional. It's not unconstitutional. There is that Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution. I respect the Constitution, and this is important to understand. Any understanding of Lincoln is his reverence for both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. And he says, we can't say that it's unconstitutional. Now, we've got to get rid of it. We've got to elect people who are going to get rid of it. Um, but I cannot stand with you on this. And uh, disappointed a lot of anti-slavery people. It's one of the reasons why um, Wendell Phillips, the great abolitionist, later on was to refer to Abraham Lincoln as the, sla the slave hound of Illinois. The slave hound of Illinois. Because you know, he was willing to go along with the constitutional character of, of, of the Fugitive Slave Act. Now, this is again getting back to Lincoln as politician, but it's also Lincoln as, as, as um, statesman. And understanding that he thought that the Constitution of the United States um, um, was a great thing. And that the Constitution of the United States did have anti-slavery potential. Indeed, he devotes an entire speech at Cooper Union to, to explaining why the um, a Constitution of the United States had this great anti-slavery potential. And he did not want to see the Constitution of the United States undone. If, if getting rid of slavery meant getting rid of the Constitution of the United States, well, you know, what, what were we going to be left with? You know, we wouldn't be left with a country. We would have been left with, a, with, a, with chaos. Or we could have been left with a monarchy. And who knows what direction that would have gone in, because they always said that slavery was the instantiation of the divine right of kings anyway. So he didn't see that as a solution. He saw that as a, as a, a setback. He also believed that the Declaration of Independence was organically connected with the, the Constitution. And he believed that the line that, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that was at the core of his political beliefs. And he believed that that was instantiated in the Constitution. And when you read the preamble of the Constitution, you can, you can understand why. So going back to the Fugitive Slave Act, you know, his understanding of the Constitution was that it was, you know, it wasn't unconstitutional. Um, people misunderstood what he was talking about. People thought that he was soft on the Fugitive Slave Act. He wasn't soft on the, the Fugitive Slave Act. He was strong on the Constitution. And, and he had to try to find a way to get rid of slavery without getting rid of the Constitution. Now, you know, the Southern, the southern slaveholders wouldn't let him do that because um, they seceded. <laughs> he gets elected with a democratic election and, uh, you know, they won't let him go about it the way that he thought it could be gotten um, done because they saw the writing on the wall. They knew very well what he was up to, he and his party. I think Lincoln gets misunderstood because people think that his devotion is to the Union rather than to getting rid of slavery. People think that his devotion is to the Constitution rather than to getting rid of slavery. He's devoted to both. He's devoted to both. When, when, when the Southern Secession comes, he realizes that he, he can't do anything about slavery until the Union is restored. There's no way for him to do anything about slavery until the Union is restored. That's why it's the number one thing. Now, does that mean he's, um, you know, that, that this is a war that's going to be, um, you know, that doesn't care about slavery? Uh, no, he was elected on a platform to get rid of slavery. Now, you know, he, when he talks about the union as it was, that means the union as it was with me elected to get rid of slavery. But he couldn't fight that war. He couldn't. He couldn't. He, rather, he couldn't. He couldn't um, go about getting rid of slavery or starting to, putting slavery as he put it in the course of ultimate extinction until he'd save the Union. That's what he thought. And um, so it's not an either or, or it's not a one rather than the other. The two are always there in his mind. The reason that the South seceded wasn't that, you know, they didn't like the Union. It's because they wanted to keep slavery. And they saw Abraham Lincoln and his party attacking slavery, and they say so. They say, that's why we're out of here. Done. They weren't paranoid. They saw what was on the line. But Lincoln understood 
that if he was going to pursue his anti-slavery agenda, what he had been elected to do was not immediate emancipation by any means. It was going to be under the Constitution, but he was going to do it, that he had to save the Union. It was only as the war continued that he realized that he couldn't, sa he couldn't save the Union without the Emancipation Proclamation. That, you know, and, 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 and a lot had happened in 1861, 62. But by the end of 1862, he's clear that, no, th this is not the right choice now. It's not a matter of saving the Union in order to get rid of slavery. I'm going to have to en emancipate. I'm going to have to pr proclaim emancipation if I want to save the Union. Um, things kind of flipped. Um, but, but that's all the dynamic of the war. I mean, that's the dynamic of what happened with him that I think is, 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 is terribly misunderstood. Um, in part because, you know, I mean, there are as many representations of, of Abraham Lincoln in history as there were um, political representations of, of Abraham Lincoln in his own lifetime. You know, I mean, there are neo-Confederate versions of Abraham Lincoln. There are neo-Copperhead versions of, of Lincoln. There are neo-Garrisonian versions of Lincoln, um, all of which give you a view of Lincoln, but it's not necessarily Lincoln. Now, I'm not just saying that we take the Lincolnian view of Lincoln. What I'm trying to say is that they are partial. And um, on this thing in particular, the idea that the Union was, not, it was all important to him and slavery was not, why would he have even run for president <laughs> as a Republican? Why, when all these compromises are being proposed to save the Union, save the Union, in 1861, 1860-61, after he's elected, there's all these compromise proposals, the Crittenden compromise, this compromise, that compromise. Save the Union, save the Union. He says, no. He says, the tug must come here. Slavery will be stopped from going into the territories. Full stop. That's it. No compromise. Now, that was about slavery. That was the way he thought that slavery was going to eventually come to an end. It wasn't the, the express. It was the local. OK, but we were on that train. Um, he, um, he was principled about that, absolutely, in a way that many Republicans were not. He was absolutely principled about that. So from the beginning, the, the Civil War was always a war about slavery. The question was, how are you going to get there? And in Lincoln's mind, um, you know, a, um, a dissevered union um, was, 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 could not be tolerated. Could not be tolerated. But... But, but it was a dissevered union that was going to be put back together again so that he could then go about doing what he could to get rid of slavery. Um, that, that, that often gets, you know, the neo-Garrisonian view doesn't, doesn't, doesn't agree with that. Although by the end of the war, Garrison did, <laughs> which is sort of interesting. Because by the end of the war, you know, Garrison and Lincoln have, have actually converged. Um, and, and Garrison kind of sees the point. Garrison actually supports Lincoln for re-election in 1864 which a lot of the abolitionists, many of the abolitionists, do not. So it's interesting that, that Garrison's, you know, latter-day admirers don't always see what Garrison himself saw. Um, but these are the politics of the, 18, of the 1850s going into the 1860s, the politics of the war. And, um, you know, unless we understand the anti-slavery origins of the Civil War, that there really were anti-slavery <laughs> origins to the Civil War. If you're going to say that sla slavery didn't cause the Civil War, institutions don't cause wars, slavery didn't cause it, anti-slavery caused the Civil War. Slavery had been around, as we said before, for a thousands of years. Anti-slavery was the new thing. That was the challenge. And it was kind of there during the Revolution, but then it got buried, then it got put pushed aside, but it came back, and it came back with, you know, to the, to the point where, in 1860, it won national power. This was extraordinary. But that's why the war happened. The war didn't happen because of slavery. The war happened became Abraham. The war, the war did not come about because of slavery. The war came about because Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States. That's why the war happened. Well, that's why secession happened, and then the war came after. And, you know, that's, that's the anti-slavery cause of the Civil War because Abraham Lincoln, by 1861, embodied the, uh, the anti-slavery cause. Not every anti-slavery person agreed with that. The, you know, there are always divisions. But in terms of national power, that was very true. 
and um, um, you know, for, 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 by misunderstanding that, we not only misunderstand Abraham Lincoln, but we misunderstand the central, the central, the central event in American history. If we get that wrong. Lincoln is elected in November 1860, and by December 20th, um, the state of South Carolina has declared its secession from the Union. Um, then a number of other lower South states leave. Um, Texas leaves pretty quickly. Mississippi leaves pretty quickly. It's a bigger fight in Georgia, actually. There's something of a fight in Louisiana. Um, but the lower South goes out first. But the border states in Virginia, in particular, it's not altogether clear that they're going to join um, the South Carolinians. You know, the South Carolinians, going back to the 1830s under Andrew Jackson during the nullification crisis, you know, when they had tried to nullify a tariff, um, they were the only ones who were for nullification. The rest of the South kind of said, well, we kind of admire you, but we're not going to go along with this craziness. Well, there was some, some of that going on in 1860-61 as well, where um, there, were, there, were, there was actually was, was a lot of um, th thought in the, in the South at that point that, in fact, um, the South was better off in the Union than out of the Union. What does that mean? Well, what it meant is this. Okay, Abraham Lincoln just got elected president. You know, what can he possibly do? He's got, he hasn't even got a full majority in the Congress. He's got a, you know, a, a plurality, but he hasn't got... What can he possibly do? Let's suppose in two years we just get rid of the, the, the Republicans in Congress, and then in four years Abraham Lincoln will be gone, and he'll be a one-term president, and the South will come back again. Why do we have to go through all of the secession? We're better off. If we're out of the Union, then all kinds of things can happen, like the Emancipation Proclamation. So there was a lot of feeling in the South in 1860 that they should not secede. Um, the Lower South, less. The fire eaters, the, the secessionists were much more powerful. Um, but it took a while. It was really Fort Sumter that changed things. I mean, once um, the um, uh, once the Confederates, once the South Carolinians um, fire upon Fort Sumter, and then Lincoln calls for seventy-five thousand volunteers to go and crush the rebellion. Well, then, then, then the die is cast, and then the border South is going to come in too. Not all of the border South, though, like Kentucky which is going to be fought over, and it's going to be a source of great you know, political difficulty for, for, for Lincoln um, you know, right through the war. Um, so not all of the border south goes out, um, but Virginia does, and that's a big deal. When the south secedes, um, the states go out individually, but then they form a nation. They, can form, the, they form the Confederate States of America. And um, um, this is in Montgomery, Alabama and eventually the capital is going to move to Richmond, but they form a nation. They're not simply going to be, you know, 11 states on their own, right? Um, they, they had to fight a war. That became clear early on. Um, but no, I mean, they, 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 Jefferson Davis is, is, is named the president, and they form their own constitution. It's interesting, the Confederate Constitution. Confederate Constitution reads almost word for word like the American Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, um, with some very... Um, important differences. Um, one thing they put God in, which is a measure of what religion was going, you know, what religion was like in the South. God appears in the, in the Confederate Revolution, in the Confederate Constitution. But at every point where the framers made it, made it clear that slavery was not going to be acknowledged in national law, the Confederate Constitution makes slavery part of the national law of the Confederacy. Um, and all the language changes and all those things that were done to keep slavery out in 1787, the Confederates put back in in 1861. Now, it's, it's kind of a difficult thing to start a nation on the basis of states' rights. <laughs> I mean, um, you're going to be getting into problems when you've, your entire um, um, you know, politics has been based, or at least in part has been based, on the idea that state rights should resist the, you know, the, the, the encroachments of the federal government, which had been there from at least the, the, the nullification crisis on, uh, which meant there were going to be all sorts of tensions between state officials and indeed local officials and the Confederate government in Richmond. And it was going to be very unstable in many respects. It was also a government that had, it was a politics rather, that were very odd in many respects from the American standpoint. It had no political parties. You know, Abraham Lincoln 
and as President of the United States, still had to contend, had to contend with the South, had to contend with the Confederates, but he also had to contend with the Democratic Party, which is full of people who hated his guts, called him a guerrilla, called him an N-word lover, all the rest of it, you know. Um, um, but it existed. It meant that political conflict was going to continue. Now, at one level, that meant that the Constitution was not going to come undone, that American politics was going to be able to continue. We're stronger. We don't have to suppress, even though we did a little bit of that. But um, you know, we're going to be able to have an election in 1864. They had elections in the South where it was kind of like elections in the old Soviet Union. I mean, he kind of knew who was going to win, and he kind of knew that the person was going to win by 95%, or you know, something like that. Um, there were no political parties. There was no political conflict, which meant that conflict could not be contained. You know, in, a, in, in, in the United States, one of the functions of parties is to actually let conflict happen. But it happens in a way that's not going to threaten the, the, the government itself. You know, one side's going to win or the other side's going to win, but there's been a fight. The fight's been allowed to happen. When you don't have that, then you're going to get all kinds of internal turmoil, which is one of the reasons that the Confederacy found, you know, found itself in difficulty. Um, you know, you had, you had state governors like Joe Brown in Georgia who weren't going to listen to Jefferson Davis. Um, you had generals who weren't particularly going to listen to Jefferson Davis. You had, um, 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 you know, it was not a, um, it was not as stable um, a government as the United States of America proved to be. Um, but that was foundering in part on its contradictions. It's also difficult to run a war, you know, as a slave society against a free society that's, that's there because you, at one time, you have to, at one level, you have to fight off the enemy that's invading, but you also have to make sure that your slaves at home aren't going to come up and, you know, uh, aren't going to run away, as many did, or are not going to, you know, uh, fight against you too. Um, you have to fight on two fronts kind of thing. I mean, and, and they, were, they managed to do that, but it was, uh, it was a fright. The slaveholders had always been terrified at the prospect of slave insurrection, you know. And, and there's an argument to be made that in some ways that's exactly what happened. I mean, it wasn't a slave insurrection in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Toussaint Louverture sense, in the Haiti sense. It wasn't what, you know, um, certainly what John Brown was thinking about. It wasn't even what David Walker was, 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 was talking about. Um, but there were runaways, and they did help the Union cause, and there's, you know, 180,000 um, black soldiers enlisted in the Union Army, many of them, most of them, I believe, former slaves. That has a lot to do with, with guaranteeing the Union victory. So you can say, in a way, that that all came true. Um, but they're terrified throughout, throughout the antebellum period that, uh, you know, that the North is going to come in and, and instigate a gigantic, you know, Haitian-like revolution. It showed that the inconsistencies of the slaveholders' idea that slavery was just wonderful, that the slaves just loved it. At the same time, they're worried about, you know, getting their throat slit half the time. I mean, you know, which, which is it? Lincoln takes office on March 4th, 1861. And when you read the first inaugural, you see that he's still hoping to convince the, the, the seceding states to, to give up, to stop. He's trying to convince them, I'm not going to do anything about slavery where it currently, currently exists. You have nothing to worry about me. Everything that, that the fire eaters are telling you is wrong. Come on back. Come on back. He's bidding them to come back. And, um, and Lincoln actually believed that he could succeed, actually. I mean, I think Lincoln overestimated the pro-unionist sentiment in the South. Um, but he certainly wasn't going to declare war on the South simply because they'd left. Um, so the, the um, um, northern public opinion was, you know, in a, in a what should we say? Um, it wasn't that it was confused. It was, um, well, the situation was confusing. You know, a war had not been declared. Um, a war, the, 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 it was going to take Fort Sumter to do that. Now, once the... Um, once, once, the, the, once the guns are, are, are once Fort Sumter is fired upon, or passive voice, once the Confederates fire on Fort Sumter, then Northern opinion really does shift in a different direction. Then, you know, this has been, a, they have fired on the flag of the United States. This now becomes, you know, a rallying cry. And there is a great um, you and cry uh, in the North of, you know, young men signing up to, to, to fight in the war against the traitors. Um, this is one of the reasons why it's, again, thought about as, as a, um, um, a war for the Union, which it was, um, because people are, are rallying to try to save the country against these crazy slaveholders who have done something really dastardly, which is to secede. And we cannot let that happen. Um, 
there are plenty of abolitionists who are there. They're all for doing it. They're all for going to war, although it took a, take, took a little while for some of the abolitionists to come along about that. But northern public opinion is, 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 is really uh, uh, out to try to crush this rebellion against the United States. They refer to it, interestingly, you know, the Civil War has many names, right? There's the Civil War. Um, there's the war between the states. That's the southern version, right? Um, there's the war of northern aggression. That's the super southern version. Um, the northern version that was actually popular at the time was the War of the Slaveholders' Rebellion. The War of the Slaveholders' Rebellion. I, I, I once lived in a little town upstate New York, in Tivoli, New York, and there's a monument to the brave men of Tivoli and the surrounding towns who had fallen in the, to, to crush the slaveholders' rebellion. That's what it was called. The rebellion was, was crucial to all of that. They had rebelled. They were rebels against you know, the American Republic. We have to stop them. But there was never any doubt who was, behind, who was behind it. You know, this was the slaveholders' rebellion they were going after. And I think that in the course of the war, and you can see this in the soldiers' letters, actually, um, slaveholders begins to, um, um, you know, um, overtake rebellion. They're both there from the beginning, but where people might have been leaning a little bit more on the rebellion side, by the time we're getting to 1864, beginning to talk about the slaveholder side. Both are always there. It's neither the one or the other. Um, so I think northern public opinion does go through that process, much as it had since the 1830s on slavery itself. You know, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln did not sweep the North on a um, um, uh, uh, being neutral about slavery. He was anti-slavery, and he won that election fair and square in the North. You know, tremendously. So it's not as if people were disposed to be, you know, um, um, neutral on the issue of slavery in 1861. But I think it was the, you know, the firing of Fort Sumter really was the, the thing that, sh that, 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 that shocked people, that they would go this far. There have been compromises all the way back to 1787, somehow there had always been a compromise. And somehow it somehow worked it out. Now, it didn't work out. And the South was to blame, a Northerners thought. I mean, Lincoln was very clear that he had to make sure that it, what, he was not going to be the aggressor, it was going to be the South that was the aggressor. And, um, and that's what happened. So, um, but, but, but it's the beginning of the war is, is different. And then, you know, also, I mean, I come back to the Gettysburg Address. I mean, I think the Gettysburg Address is where you see truly what had happened, I mean, it, it, to Northern opinion. I mean, Lincoln is ahead of Northern opinion, to be sure, on this. But you see what has happened. I mean, there he is at the battlefield of the greatest conflict of the war. Um, to, bury the, to bury the dead. Um, the war has become something that it was not at the beginning. Um, the war has become the war for a new birth of freedom. The word slavery doesn't actually appear in that, in that speech, but everybody knew what he was talking about as a new birth of freedom. Um, it's a war for democracy, above all, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Um, that's demo democratic rule. He had been elected president democratically. The South seceded. That cannot be allowed. So by the time we get to November 1863, I think that what, and the reason that Lincoln's speech was so powerful was that, and he could do this, he, he, he drew together what had been the gathering force of, 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 of northern opinion. Not everybody, by any means, but he, he marked the shift to rededicate, in effect, the war itself, which is what happens at, at, at the Gettysburg Address. Again, and I said earlier, I mean, with um, absolute lucidity and clarity, um, every word weighed, every word mattered. Um, that was his prose. Um, but I think that that's where you see, um, you know, the, the North that's to be, or the cause that's to be really, really coming into being. And he gave voice to it. There were two big speeches at Gettysburg in November 1863. One was Edward Everett's, which went on forever and um, is completely forgotten. Um, and the other is Abraham Lincoln's, 272 words, um, which is remembered by everyone. Um, Lincoln's purpose was pretty straightforward. His purpose was to dedicate a battlefield and a battlefield graveyard, a cemetery. 
that's what he was there to do. Um, but by the time he got to 1863, the end of 1863, um, the character of the war had changed. Uh, the character of the war had shifted. Many, many, many tens, hundreds of thousands of people had died. Um, the war had proven to be not at all what it looked like it might be in 1861. It turned out to be a war of horrifying carnage on top of everything else. Um, so here was Lincoln really in a sea of death, actually, when you think about it, um, what had been um, a sea of death. And these are the remains. And he was trying to make sense of all of that. You know, L Lincoln thought about death a lot. Um, uh, Lincoln, you know, it's not that there was morbid, but he had a sense of mortality about him. And, and you can see that in, in various aspects of his life. But I think that he was confronting that, the sacrifice that had been made on such a massive scale. And he tried to to put that together, he tried to you know, bring together what the purposes of the war actually were. And to do so, to explain the sacrifice and to honor that sacrifice um, in a way that you know, went beyond um, really any, anything he'd actually said before. You know, he had had quite the occasion to do this. Um, he had annual messages and so forth, but really this was a different kind of occasion. That's what he did. And that's what he did at Gettysburg, um, to announce, no surprise, but still it had to be said that this was a new birth of freedom, that the American Revolution was being reborn in this war, in this great titanic struggle, um, but that the war stood, in the end, for democracy itself, and that the two went together. You know, as I said, there's always been the central problem of American history. It had always been how could this democratic republic deal with slavery and its and its legacy, and that struggle over that was is is the, is the struggle of American history. At Gettysburg, it came to a head, and he put them both together. That the salvation, the vindication of democracy, requires a new birth of freedom and that the new birth of freedom goes hand in hand with the salvation, the vindication of democracy. The two are there. Um, that's what I think uh, Gettysburg does you know, in an extraordinary way. I mean, insofar as um, Lincoln's idea, that the, the fundamental idea of the United States, of America, was in the Declaration. It was the proposition that all men are created equal. That is to say, human equality. Um, if that's the center of the whole thing, if that's it, here we are. This is the moment, and that's what these men died for. And um, we will continue. We will continue the struggle. I mean, you can read the Gettysburg Address as, 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 as a perennial, as everlasting, because the struggle really isn't over. You can read it today and say, we're still here, President Lincoln. We're still fighting. You know, and, 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 and that's what gives it its timelessness, I think. Um, and, and many more people have had to die in that struggle. Um, but uh, we're going to keep it going. And we're going to keep it going just the way you, you, you did it. You know, because we understand that, that freedom is about the vindication of America. You know, that, that, that America does stand for something. And if we, can, um, um, if we can fight that fight, as you understood it, as you helped us understand, um, we'll have lived to a noble purpose. That's Gettysburg. Frederick Douglass is a great man. Frederick Douglass is a great abolitionist. And Frederick Douglass actually had broken with, with Garrison on the question of the Constitution. So, but, but, you know, but he's a radical. He's an agitator. He's the, he's the radical. And, uh, you know, whereas Lincoln's the Republican. So, you know, there's a kind of division of labor here. Um, there's the radical agitator, and there's the political leader, the politician, the president. Now, that's going to lead to possibilities of convergence, but most of the time it's going to lead to all kinds of conflict. Um, and it can lead in both ways. Um, and that's certainly led in both ways in the case of uh, Frederick Douglass and, and Abraham Lincoln. Um, Abraham Lincoln gives his first inaugural address, and 
um, Frederick Douglass reviews it and kind of gives it a pan. I mean, he really hated it. He just said, you know, honest Abe, huh, there's no honest here. You know, he's dragged the Constitution to the gutter. He's talking about all this stuff. He's not talking about getting rid of slavery, which is what was important. Well, Abraham Lincoln wasn't going to talk about that because he wanted to try to keep the Union together at that moment. Slavery wasn't the issue that he was going to be talking about. It didn't get off to a great start. Let's put it that way. Thereafter, I sometimes say, you know, Frederick Douglass is always getting ticked off at Abraham Lincoln because Abraham Lincoln isn't doing enough. And so he goes into the White House. He's going he's to show, you know, give the president a piece of his mind. And it was a great mind to be giving him a piece of. So there was a lot there. And he always goes in and he's going to, and he always leaves saying, he's so great. He's such a wonderful guy. This president, this Abraham Lincoln, you know, now part of that had to do with the way that Lincoln treated a black man, which was, you know, how many... There have been slaves had been in, 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 in the White House. Um, not a whole lot of people like Frederick Douglass. Simple respect was part of it. But it was also, I think, that, 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 that Lincoln could bring out in Douglass the logic of what he was doing. He, he, he helped Douglass understand what he was doing, that he wasn't being dilatory, that he had a reason for doing what he was doing. So Douglass would come away, you know, wow, this is great. And then he'd forget all about all of that. And he'd go back with his radical friends and he'd get ticked off again. So that in 1864, he's actually backing, you know, he's not backing Lincoln for the, for the, for the presidency. He's backing Fremont along with the other radicals. Goes back to the White House. And he has another conversation with President Lincoln and with Secretary of War Stanton. And they talk about deputizing, in effect, Frederick Douglass to go and bring more slaves, more enslaved you know, runaways to the Union lines to help organize. He, thoughts, he thinks of it as the John Brown plot. Well, it's not exactly that, but it's, you know, he's going to make, this is a military thing, and he's so happy. And he's going to, now, it didn't happen because in the end, Sherman took Atlanta and the war took a different course, and that wasn't necessary. Um, but then their final meeting is the most extraordinary one because there's been this back and forth. Right? The radical pushing the president, he's not doing enough. Um, he's just another politician. The president's saying, here's this great man, but God, he's giving me such headaches. I'm going to try and bring him over to my side. He does for a time. But then comes the final meeting, which is extraordinary, because this is on March 4th, 1865. And um, Lincoln has just delivered the second inaugural. And you remember the second inaugural is the, is the speech where he actually takes the full measure of slavery and the war, or attempts to. The war is not over yet. The war is still continuing. Um, it's pretty clear that the Union's gonna win, but it's not over by a long shot. And um, he talks about how, you know, if there must be one drop of blood drawn by the sword for every drop of blood drawn by the lash, we will pay that price. Now that's a, that's, um, that's pretty heavy. Um, and, and, and people remember actually the, 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 the bind up the nation wounds and you know, charity for all, malice towards uncharity for all part of the speech, which is important. But there's also the full understanding of slavery and slavery and the war. At any rate, um, so Lincoln gives a speech and they, you know, it's inauguration day, they go back to the White House, they're gonna have a big reception. Frederick Douglass shows up for the reception. And um, the guards, the white guards, see Frederick Douglass, and they say, oh, he's, this black guy's not getting in. So they, they stop him from, from getting in. And then eventually he manages to get his way into the, I guess it's the East Room of the White House, big reception. Lincoln sees him in the back of the crowd coming in, and he says, there's my friend Douglass. I want to speak to my friend Douglass. Right? Now, it's nothing... It, People can make him out, what a great guy. There's nothing especially noble about this. It's just that he's treating this person as a person, as his friend. Now, you know, he's being a politician too, because, you know, six months earlier, he was, Douglas was after his hide. Here comes my friend Douglas. And he brings him to the, you know, to, calls him forth, calls him forward. And, and he says to him, I want to know, what did you think of that speech? I really want to know what you thought of that speech. You care, I really care what you thought of that speech. To which Douglas says, it was a sacred effort, sir. It was a sacred effort. 
And that's the last meeting between the two of them. Right? And, um, you know, five weeks later, Lincoln's dead. But what I think we see in that relationship is the convergence of the radical and the, and the president. You know, in American politics, people misunderstand this a lot, you know, a lot, that there is a division of labor. And when it works, when American politics works, when change really happens, is when the forces of, of equality, egalitarianism, understand what politicians have to put up with, and when politicians have to understand what the egalitarians have to put up with. And, you know, when it really can work, and I suppose you've seen it, we've seen it in American history, we've seen it in, during the New Deal we saw it, we certainly saw it in the 60s, you know, um, that moment when Lyndon Johnson actually gives a speech where he says, we shall overcome, and Dr. King, you know, weeps, that's the moment of convergence. That's how things get done. That doesn't mean it's gonna be, you know, um, you know, it's, it's not all gonna be um, um, lemonade and, 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 um, and, and, and twinkle toast. It's not all gonna be happy. It can't be happy. It shouldn't be happy. Um, but, what, but each side has to understand the other and get it and understand it. That's politics in a way. I mean, you know, the greatest reformers, the greatest egalitarians have been the ones who were also politicians um, who understand politics. I was talking about John Lewis earlier. He's, he's an example of that. But I think Dr. King was that way as well. And, you know, and by Rustin and those guys. I mean, people who understood that, that politicians have to be understood, not just, you know, denigrated. Because if you want to get anything done, you've got to get, that's how the, they're the ones who are going to get it done. Politicians, like, likewise, have to understand that, you know, um, the forces of change are unruly. <laughs> the forces of change are not, you know, going to be there to kiss your butt. They're going to be there to fight you because things need changing and you're in the way, sort of, unless you can prove, until you can prove that you're not. Now, Lyndon Johnson could understand that. I think John Kennedy sort of began to understand that. Certainly his brother understood that, he came to understand that. Robert Kennedy understood that. The people at the Justice Department understood that, you know, the Civil Rights Division. They understood that. Um, in America, um, on, 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 and it doesn't always happen, but the extraordinary moments are when that happens. So what I'm saying is really that Douglas and, and Lincoln are an example of that. I mean, um, it's not as if Douglas is the leader of a movement. He's not. He's, he's, he is a spokesman for a point of view. Um, um, because the civil, you know, because the abolitionist movement, while it continued, it was still out there. It wasn't the same as it had been before the war, before the Republican Party came on. So it's a different. It's not exactly the same. But you know, but Douglas is the great spokesman of, of you know, of black abolitionism, of, of, of black America in many ways at that point. You know, and um, it was not easy, <laughs> but um, but I think that they both show the capacity to understand one another. They came to understand where, where they were in, 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 this, in this struggle. And, um, you know, and, and so I think that's where, historically, that's what their, their importance, what, what the importance of that relationship is. Um, and something we can take from it, not just historically, but you know, in our own lives. Um, um, which is, again, it's not being wussy. It's not giving anybody a break. You can't give anybody a break, but you have to understand where, they, where they're coming from in the political system. And, uh, you know, I mean, it does, it is remarkable how people can, this is what being a politician in part is about, is that you don't take things personally. And, and, and you understand where the person who's, you know, even if he's really your enemy, or if he's your ally who thinks he's your enemy, you have to understand where they're standing, why they're standing where they're standing. And if you can understand that, then, um, then you can act with wisdom. Um, and you know, that was certainly something that, 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 that Lincoln gained. And I think, I think Douglas did too. The question of what was going to happen um, racially after emancipation went all the way back to the 18th century. And people were wondering, you know, if, there was, if we are getting rid of slavery, what's going to happen? Are we going to be able to coexist um, are the races going to be able to coexist harmoniously or not? And 
you know, most white people, I mean, Thomas Jefferson's a good example, but I mean, not, he not alone, thought that that was impossible. Not because they thought that black people were terrible, although Jefferson's not particularly, you know, um, what should we say, um, 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 noble in this regard, but um, because there was a belief that after all that had happened, it was impossible to imagine a biracial society. There was some that was about black inferiority, that blacks are inferior to whites, and we have to have this, you know, get them out of here. We have to have this beautiful white society, and there's that racist reason. There's also the reasons that things have been so terrible for so long. We, we cannot, it's impossible. Um, that's the pessimistic view. That's a pessimistic view that's, that runs throughout American history about race relations. There's always a, there's always a pessimistic view um, about race relations. Um, there's an optimistic view as well. And you see it in bits and pieces in, um, um, among whites before, uh, in the earlier period, more, much, much more among African Americans. Um, in the, you know, one of those extraordinary things, in fact, is, is the degree to which absolutely, I mean, the reason that they oppose colonization, many of them, not all, there are some black colon pro-colonizationists in, in bad periods, um, um, but you know, they don't wanna, they were Americans. This is what David Walker is saying. I'm an American, you know. I'm gonna call you Americans, you white people, but I'm an American too. I deserve to be here. I'm not going. You know, this, I, I built this country as much as you did. Okay, so, so there are these, t these two things are, 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 are there from the start. Um, I think you said, Jackie, the, the year 1864. Lincoln himself had been a pessimist, um, you know, much like his, his hero, Henry Clay, he couldn't imagine, especially in the 1850s. The 1850s was a period in the aftermath of the Fugitive Slave Act where you know, racial pessimism was really on the rise on both sides of the color line. I mean, it's then that you see you know, um, Martin Delaney getting his stuff together and you see even Douglas' sons are getting involved. Frederick Douglass, in fact, even is talking for a little bit of time about, about um, colonization you know, projects and so forth. There's really a feeling in the aftermath of the Fugitive Slave Act and everything that happened that this is not gonna be possible. You know, this is not gonna be possible. And, um, um, you know, and, and, and Lincoln you know, kind of goes along with, you know, he's part of all of that. Um, but you know, he also always says, but it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, how are you gonna take 3.8 million, just, just taking the, the enslaved people by themselves, how are you gonna get 3.8 million people, there aren't enough boats. You know, it's not gonna happen. At one of the same time, he, in his pessimism, right, his pessimism tells him, tells him it's never gonna work out. But his practical side says, well, we have no choice. We have no choice. Now, I can't imagine how we're gonna do it, but what are we talking about? And so when he's president, you know, he does, you know, and this goes to the, the famous meeting in 1862, right at the same time as the Horace Greeley letter, you know, when he meets with these very distinguished um, um, Washington, African Americans from Washington, D.C., you know, and he, and he treats them rather rudely you know, and, and, and he starts talking about colonization ideas, and you should look into all of that. And he say, say, well, we'll look into it. He says, take all the time you want. Well, the one of the reasons he says take all your time you want, because he knows he has the Emancipation Proclamation in his back pocket, so, you know, it's, it's all gonna be there. Um, but I think as, as late as the annual message in 1862, he's still talking about, you know, colonization and stuff. Um, but by the time we get to 1864, which is the year you mentioned, he's kind of sloughed all that off, as I think John Hay says. He, John Hay thought this whole thing was nuts from the start, and uh, he, he, he said, thank, thank goodness he's not talking about colonization anymore. It was a vestige by the time he got to 1863, by the time he got to 1862. It wasn't gonna happen. While Lincoln was always naturally anti-slavery, I think that the war, um, and, and while he always had you know, perfectly friendly and warm relations with, with, with African Americans, I think the war, for the same reason getting to Gettysburg, that's the point, the sacrifice. You know, the, the fact that, 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 that so many um, um, black Americans had sacrificed so much, to, even to get into the army, let alone to fight in it, um, made, it made, made a great impression on him too. Um, brought him closer or something to, 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 to an idea and so by the time you get to, you know, 
um, April 1865, he's talking, you know, he's the first American president who ever talked about the possibilities of any kind of black citizenship, um, of being, you know, giving, giving black men the right to vote, um, which is, of course, why he dies. He is assassinated in part because, you know, he, he, um, he, he's certainly not talking about colonization anymore by the time we get to April 1865. And he gave his, gives this speech where he says he believes, and he'd already written, let me back up, he'd already written a letter to Michael Hahn in Louisiana talking about how there ought to be some kind of suffrage rights to given to, to ex-slaves, ex-slave men. I mean, women are not yet a part of the, the equation. Um, and so he's already kind of on record in his own mind about that, but then he gives a speech in, um, um, in Washington, um, I guess after he come back from Richmond, and um, he says that he you know, believes that you know at least some of the um, uh, uh, of those who had served the nation, you know, some African Americans ought to be given the vote. And in the crowd is John Wilkes Booth, and John Wilkes Booth mutters, famously or infamously, notoriously, that means end citizenship. I'll put him through. Now, he'd already been thinking about getting, killing Lincoln at that point. But that was a moment. So you can say, in the end, I mean, it's a little bit romanticized, perhaps, but that, you know, that Lincoln was a martyr for black citizenship in a way, um, at least as far as John Wilkes Booth was concerned. Um, so, so, th so there was that. There are these periods of, of optimism and pessimism on race relations, and there always have been. Um, and it's on both sides of the color line. Um, and it's among, uh, and, and not just the color line, but the political line, you know, you know progressives and reactionaries, or however you want to put it. You know, and, and there are moments when, um, you know, I mean, I was growing up in the, in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, into the, into the 60, 1965, it was a, moment of great optimism, you know, things were changing. Entire structures were being, you know, undone. Not easily, but they were being undone. Um, I think we've been living in a period of real pessimism for a very long time. And, um, um, you know, and, and you can see that in the way people, people feel. I mean, you know, I think about young people growing up today and they've grown up in a period where despite the election of an African-American president, nevertheless, it doesn't seem like anything's really changed. And in some ways, you've gone backwards. You know, when you get rid of the Voting Rights Act, things have gone backwards. Um, why? Because it can't work. Because America is not what it says it is. Because America is, you know, is a lie, basically. I mean, you might say it's the truth, you might think it's the truth, but it's not really the truth. That's the pessimistic view. You know, that America cannot imagine biracial harmony, if that's the term we want to use. Cannot imagine uh, a beloved community. It can't, because America isn't built for that. That's, we've been living with that for a while. And, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln is the best example, one of the best examples of, 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 of that being a lie, or that being not the whole truth in any way that there is an optimistic side here that we really have to own. Um, but again, that's because the struggle is always on. I mean, you know, that's why we read the Gettysburg Address. I mean, it's to realize that that is possible. Um, and that's why the words, I think, can stir us, is that um, in that direction of understanding that you cannot have America unless you have freedom. You know, and, and, and in a way, you can't have freedom unless you have America the America that was promised, the promissory note that, that, that Dr. King talked about. You know, it requires, because you can't get freedom, where else are you gonna get freedom? You're gonna get freedom in England? You're gonna get freedom in Russia? You're not gonna get freedom there, you're gonna get freedom here. So the two go together, you have to have them both. And that's the, but that's the optimistic view. And uh, you know, I mean, I'm gonna go to my grave an optimist, but, um, but to be an optimist living in pessimistic times is quite a, you know, quite a sentence from heaven. The reaction to Lincoln's assassination of African Americans was one of, of, of unbounded grief. 
and, and horror, sorrow. Um, I mean, there are lots of you know, descriptions of Lincoln's body being borne from Washington out to Springfield, that long, long train, tra train trip, and stopping off along the way, and how at every stop, you know, African Americans were, you know, the most, or among the most grief stricken. And, and this actually goes back to even before he was shot in, in, in Richmond. When he goes to Richmond, he comes to Richmond, it's the African American community. It's the blacks, ex former slaves now, that, and uh, free, who flocked to him. You know, he was really thought of as an emancipator. He really was. And um, so his, and his death on Good Friday, I mean, you know, it's so redolent with Christian imagery, and, and, and it's almost, you can't believe it. You can't believe it's true. And I think for the African-American communities, all of these places, it was unbounded grief. And what's to come, you know, and what's to come of us? I mean, we just got freedom. What, what's, who's this guy, Andrew Johnson? What, uh huh? You know, it's not, a, it's not as if it was a sure thing. <laughs> So, so, but I think that just the great love of, 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 of uh, you know, of Lincoln um, was, 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 was on display. Um, in the South, there were some who kind of got it, who said, um, this is a terrible thing. Um, this is a terrible thing for us, because they saw that Lincoln's martyrdom could only encourage, you know, um, the radicals in, in, in the North to come down even harder against the South. I mean, here they were, they just, you know, done this, you know, won the, they just lost this war, you know, and uh, I mean, imagine, say, you know, that some German had bumped off FDR right, right at the end of World War II and you're a German. You're thinking, oh no, this is not going to be good. Well, you know, I mean, it's not a perfect analogy, but you just hear what I'm saying. So some Southerners got that. Uh, but there were plenty of Southerners who thought, finally, that it was the last act of the Civil War, and they won. They won. Six Semper Tyrannus. You know, I mean, I, 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 I still, I got down south a fair amount. Not that much, but some. And you can still see people selling T-shirts, you know, with Six Semper Tyrannus on it. I mean, that established, that act established a legacy um, um, a poisonous legacy that is, that is still very much with us. And it's there, it's not just in the South, but it's really deep in the South, the White South. So, um, yeah, there were plenty of people real happy. Um, I think, you know, look at Mary Boykin Chestnut's diary. I mean, I think she, she, she says some rather choice words about the, um, the um, demise of the president that she'd come to despise. I mean, Lincoln had freed the slaves, as far as they were concerned, you know. Um, this was the undoing of everything that they believed was holy, Christian, and American. Had this man, and this man was responsible for it. You know, Frederick Douglass, all those other, he was the man responsible. So, so there was plenty of, you know, um, um, celebration. And uh, I don't have the stories in front of me, but you can find them. I mean, there's plenty of stories of, of, uh, of Southerners. I mean, it's funny the Lincoln, the Lincoln, the Lincoln image in the in the Southern mind because by the time you get to D.W. Griffith, by the time you get to Birth of a Nation, right? Lincoln's a good guy um, because Lincoln was the guy who was going to spare them the horrors of Reconstruction. He was going to be, you know, malice towards none, charity for all. So you know, Lincoln kind of gets reabsorbed in the public in the Southern white imagination. Not that there's any one Southern white imagination. You know what I'm saying? But in that in that part of the, the, the imagination, you know, he gets reabsorbed as a good guy, so you know, everybody can like Abraham Lincoln. Um, 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 but at the time, you know, no, he was, you know, the man responsible for your, you know, for your, for your son's death, for your, for your, you know, it was a war. And, and it wasn't just about, you know, it wasn't, it was, yes, it was about, it was about slavery, but it was a war, too, and people had suffered and died, and people had seen their entire, you know, if you're along Sherman's march, you know, you're pretty ticked off, but you're ticked off at Sherman, but you're also ticked off at Lincoln. You're not so happy to, you're not so sad to see that somebody bumped him off, you know, because of what had happened to you. This is the one, you know, America, Civil War was the one, one war until recently, but at least up until Vietnam, it's the one war that Americans lost. But it wasn't every American, it was just some Americans. And um, white, the white South is, you know, that's, a, that's still a theme in understanding, you know, a big theme in understanding, you know, American history. 
um, let alone the history of, of the South. Um, and Lincoln, Lincoln's death was, is part of all of that. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, look at the photographs. The photographs of, of the, um, I mean, you're thinking about the North now. The photographs of the crowds and the, it, it's a bit like, I mean, for those of us of a certain age, it's a bit like, you know, reliving what we left, li went through in 1963 to see <coughs> the, um, the crowds lined up. I mean, he, he was just taken across to Arlington. It wasn't shipped out to Boston or something. But, um, you know, the, the, the feeling that this can't be happening, and it is, and, and, and uh, a kind of stunned stunned. I mean, and even more, I think, in Lincoln's case, much more in Lincoln's case, because it had come after the war. I mean, it was the last act of the Civil War. Um, and uh, to think that at the moment of, of absolute glory, not just for a man, but for a whole cause, you know, at a moment of absolute glory, of absolute fulfillment. I mean, the, the day that he died, or maybe the day before he was riding around in his carriage with, with his wife, and you know, he was just feeling, I am so happy now, finally. I am, I am, it is done. It is done. That's a personal thing. But the entire country was feeling that way, the South one way and the North another. I mean, it's beyond Shakespeare. It's beyond any kind of um, example you can name of tragedy. Um, um, Whitman tried to write about it, wrote about it beautifully in, in, in in when lilacs last on the door, in the dooryard blo bloomed, and, um, and 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 he makes the point in that poem actually that I was trying to make very poorly, which is that he moves from the the death the the the, the ceremonies for Lincoln Lincoln's death, and the flambeaux the, the fire at night as people were, you know were trying to see the coffin, and then but then moves out over the um, the um, all the dead in the war, and and the carnage of the war, and then eventually comes to these, you know, the symbols, the thrush and the, the drooping star, and uh, death is is. It was the 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 embodiment, if you will, of death, as a as a as a. As as, as an aspect of life, and um, it, it it took someone of Whitman's, imagination to 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 to. to make clear just how profound that event was. Going even beyond the Civil War, going to uh, the, the depths of our, our humanity. Um, um, yeah, um, it was, um, it is, it's still. Um, go to Ford's Theater sometime. I mean, just, you know, you're, you're eternally at the moment where you wanna just, you know, stand at that door and keep that guy from getting in there. And, 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 and stop it, just stop it. But you know, you can't. Even historians can't do that. Um, but you don't want to, you want to. Or you want to say, don't go. <laughs> don't go to the theater tonight, stay home. Stay home with your wife, have a good time. You know, it, there's this, always this moment where you think you can, you can undo these, these events. And, and, and it's only because it's so profound, you know. It's, it's so much deeper than, than even, even history. Six Temper Tyrannus is the motto of the state of, of Virginia, and it means ever thus to tyrants. And um, um, it's not altogether clear whether Booth actually said this, but it, there were witnesses who said at the time in the theater that after he jumped out of the box, and he may have hurt his leg then, maybe not, it doesn't matter, that he brandished his, the knife that he had used to, to um, slice open Major Rathbone's arm, that he held up his knife and muttered the words, or uttered the words, six sem semper tyrannis, which would be a perfectly, you know, in character, on stage, John Wilkes Booth, you know, dr uh, bit of dr dramatism, a uh, bit of dramatics, rather. Um, it would be a perfect John Wilkes Booth dramatics because that's what he was doing. It was for the, for the world. So that's what it means, ever thus to tyrants. And yes, when you, 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 you can go, I, last time I, I, where was I? I think it was in South Carolina. 
I was at a barbecue joint, and they're selling six Semper Tyrannis, you know, um, uh, T-shirts, you know, with a picture of, of Booth shooting the president. Um, I didn't buy one, um, but I, I should have. I should have bought one. Just, just, you know, I don't care whether, you know, the money was going to go to somebody anyway. Just as an example, just to remind people what it's still like down there, because that was only 10 years ago. So that's what it means. <laughs>